Hello, it's Jim Powers. Welcome to Cappy Zoom 2022. I'll be the host, otherwise known as Wind Watcher, on the Cap forums. This is a gathering of kite aerial photographers from around the world. A virtual meeting in January the 29th, 2022. It's been a tough couple years, and we haven't had a chance to gather face to face because of COVID. Uh, and we've been staying in contact through these virtual sessions that are held uh, once or twice a year uh, via Zoom. So what follows next is about 25 kite aero photographers sharing their experiences, their learnings, uh, and their teachings. So I'd ask you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Chris, uh, I um, am Chris on the forums. Uh, I'm Chris Benton. I'm the Cappy Zoom. Uh, I am in Berkeley, California, uh, in the United States on the Pacific Coast. Started capping in 1995, uh, which makes me a 26-year veteran. Uh, I'll throw in my shock at, at how time flies kind of comment uh, there. My favorite kite in our stable coastal winds is a Sutton flow form. I use the 8, 16, and 30. If I had to pick one of those, it'd be the Sutton 16. I use it the most. Runner-up is the Rokoku. I, I adore my Rokokus. Uh, in terms of cameras, I am a love the one you're with person. And my current camera is the Canon EOS M6 Mark II with the 11 to 22 millimeter uh, lens. Thank you, uh, Chris. And again, we just started the recording and I wanna welcome everyone to Cappy Zoom 2022. And the next person to give us an introduction would be Isabel Noel. At least that's what the uh, <laughs> label says. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, well, it's not as, I'm actually on my wife's computer, so I'm, I'm a man. As you probably You're not see. alone. I have a beard. I have a deeper voice. I'm a man. Uh, my name is Mark, Mark Noel, as in Christmas. All jokes are allowed uh, during December. Um, I'm living on the Isle of Man. Uh, where we have a, yet another gale blowing at the moment. It's about 70 miles an hour out there, so we may have a power cut as well. Um, I've had a kite since about the age of 10, um, but I started to cap about uh, nine months ago um, when I found in a bottom drawer um, a kite, which I should be talking about in my little presentation. And I got this kite out and I started flying it again after a long time. And it really ignited. I wanted to be a child again. So that's, that was the first incentive. Um, and then I um, got onto this forum and I bought a couple of kites. Um, I've got a, an Into the Wind, um, a Delta Coney. But my favorite kite, absolute favorite kite, um, is Hoffman's Delta Canard, which aesthetically is absolutely gorgeous. It flies unbelievably stably at a high angle. I love that to bits. And I've just, for Christmas, I was given... Um, uh, a, a cap um, foil, cap foil kite, which pulls like a train, cap foil three. So that's been great fun. So that's where I live, that's what I do. And my background is I'm a geophysicist and um, I like, I love um, engineering design, making stuff, inventing stuff and applying that to this amazing hobby. So that's that's me. Hope I answered all the questions for that, that the headmaster set. I think you're aeronaut, aren't you? Oh, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm Aeronaut. That's right. Yes, yes. I have a website which follows that name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aeronaut. Yeah. Done some good stuff there. All right. Next up is uh, Craig. Craig Wilson. Uh, hello, everybody. Craig Wilson. I think that's my screen name as well uh, on, the, uh, on the forum. Um, I'm contacting you today directly from the Midwest, uh, Madison, Wisconsin area. We've got a little snow here as well, and the deer are running around out in the backyard here today. Um, let's see, I've been doing CAP for about 35 years, started in about 86. So um, it's uh, the, the rig that I used, I was just thinking about that this morning. I was looking at it, I'm charging it up to go out on a project tomorrow, and I was looking at it and I realized that I built it in, in 1998. So. So, you know, more than a, almost a 25 year old rig. So, and it still works just like the day I built it. So um, one, one good thing about keeping things simple, I guess. 
Um, my favorite kite is, uh, for most of that 35 years, has been a big delta. But uh, since meeting Peter Boltz and uh, flying the Maxi Dopero, I have to say that that's a pretty close second, if not maybe eclipsed it, mostly because the, the, in the conditions that you use a big Dopero, are just so splendid for cap. And um, so if th that would be my, my probably my kind of choice because that's going to mean the great conditions for, for good imagery as well. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm just really pleased to, to be part of this organization today. Thank you, Jim, for putting this together. And if I can just also uh, give one little shout out to Wolfgang, who we're going to hear from soon. Uh, what a beautiful story in Kiting Magazine. I've been getting Kiting Magazine since the early 80s. And I do believe this might be the very first cap on the cover. So congratulations on that, Wolfgang. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a great hobby. And uh, this is great to be together with all of you folks. Hey, great. Thank you for that, Craig. Next up is Mike. Hi, I'm Mike LaDuke. Uh, screen name is Iowa Capper from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, so not far from Craig. Uh, I'll be coming up on 50 years from capping next year. I started in 73 when I was 13. Uh, and just have always been really interested in things that fly and taking pictures from the air. Uh, primarily kites, but a lot of like balloons and uh, tried early homemade quadcopter type things and, and rockets and things. but. Kites are kind of the mainstay, which I really love, which I think we all kind of have in common. Um, my favorite kite, uh, I, I really like the Levitation Delta. I've kind of settled on that for a lot of things just because of playing with the, the, the adaptive crossbar on the back. Um, but also like um, Delta Conan's quite a bit and the uh, Flowform 30 um, and Rokuku's. Um, but the Delta is probably my, my, my main kite. Um, I'm an electrical engineer, did hardware uh, flight control design for 33 years here in Collins in, in Cedar Rapids. So I have a lot of interest in things that fly and controlling flight control systems and things like that. So that's been kind of kind of cool with, with kites and all. Um, favorite camera, um, there's a lot over the years, but probably the Ricoh GR for me uh, has, has been kind of the one that I've been getting the best uh, use out of, I guess, so, okay. Good, thank you, Mike. Uh, Andrea. Hello, hello to everybody. You hear me? Yes. Okay, yep. um, first time, sorry for my English, but I tried to explain my experience. I started in uh, 1988 with CAP. Uh, my first kite was a, a Cody kite, so a little big kite. But uh, next year, I, I try to use other kind of kite. Uh, and um, my big experience was on uh, a Delta kite uh, with a big uh, camera uh, hanged inside. Um, I start with a reflex camera. And uh, only when I meet other caper in Europe, I changed my uh, idea and mentality to use uh, other kind of kite like uh, a flow form. And uh, just in uh, mm, this time, I'm using a Delta kite, R8 Delta, because I, I said uh, I'm a student of Volcan Big. So I think uh, life system is uh, very pretty for me. I, I love to use uh, a, a very light system. For this reason, I, I made uh, um, different kind of uh, cradle for uh, GoPro. And uh, in this time, I'm still working uh, on uh, a little cradle on, with a, a cannon, a compact cannon. Uh, and also, uh, I like a lot to, to make historical cap system and uh, produce a replica on historical uh, cap system. And uh, if possible, this evening, I can show something to all. Yep, for sure. I have you on the agenda. Uh, <laughs> next up, uh, Wolfgang. 
Hello to everybody. Nice to see you again, or nice to see you the first time. Uh, I live in Germany, about 80 kilometers south of Hamburg. And also here we have uh, stormy weather. Uh, I started with kite aerial photography in 1987 to 1988. And uh, over the time, uh, the camera I most like, it depends always to the wind. So it may be the GoPro 3. So it may be the Ricoh GR. I also had a rig called Big Red by Brooks Leffler <laughs> in the uh, 19th. And so I am now only able to call my rigs little blue, little red, little green, little black. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still working on these uh, rigs uh, to optimize uh, several things because uh, mistakes always and every, uh, everywhere may happen. So uh, I hope finally I start to know all mistakes. <laughs> uh, also the kite I use depends uh, to the wind. In the last years, I mainly flew the R8 after Dan Lay. It's only a replica. And the recommendation was made by uh, Pierre Glissage. Once he wrote on his webpage, if he had only the chance to take one kite on his global trip, he would choose the R8. So it was an inspiration. And so I uh, built a R8 by uh, Mr. Schuster from Austria. He is expert for light wind conditions. And Mike Leduc, uh, your dynamic spreader is for me one of the most ingenious inventions for the Delta and I like it. <laughs> so I can use the R8 in a wide wind range. Uh, range. That's for me very important. But once I was not able to lift a GoPro with the R8, so I enlarged the R8 by 40% and Pierre uh, suggested to call it R11. <laughs> and now I'm ready to walk with no wind to do some cup. <laughs> um, so mostly I use uh, deltas now. And I feel very good with a dynamic spreader wherever I fly the deltas. Okay. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, next You're up, welcome. I'm going by the names that are on the screen is Lily, which I don't think it's Lily, but that's what it shows. Uh, yes, uh, Lily's the last name. The first name is Davis. Uh, I've been a bit of a lurker on the site recently. Well, actually, for um, uh, I, I would probably post as uh, Big Dave. I'm a big I'm a big boy at six six. Uh, I'm in the in the, I'm in the Seattle area. Um, my my history and cap is is varied. I uh, I built a rig back when um, uh, Chris and Brooks's site were just about all that was available. So, so th thank you, Chris. Uh, you've been uh, you were really motivational for me early, early on, and so I um, I, I built a rig, had the you know had a a, a film camera at that time, and then uh, life got and um, my favorite kite, which I actually leads into the story, is I have a fairly ancient what I think is a Floform sixteen, which is was really fun to fun to fly. And I, uh, I flew that at a company picnic in August, uh, even to, <laughs> a couple of years ago, despite, despite, uh, despite COVID. And that just like really cranked up. And I looked at the rig that I had never flown and decided I could uh, rebuild it lighter and better. And um, I'm a bit of a junker hitting Goodwill and Value Village and stuff and, and picked up a $6 used a uh, little little nikon uh, shoot and uh that's that's the 
that's the camera I feel like I want to fly right now, just just out of curiosity to see what kind of images I can get with a six dollar camera. Mind you, that I probably spent uh, three or four times that, uh, you know, radio and uh, uh, putting together a rig. I, I guess uh, I, I'm pretty strong in in photography and uh, radio controlled. I used to race uh, uh, hydroplanes. And uh, so, so I've got the RC down. It's just I'm, I'm a pretty weak kite flyer and I kind of need help in that direction. All right, well, thank you, welcome. Next up is Sandro. Hey, so uh, my first name is Sandro uh, Macchi. Uh, but the uh, nickname is Smack. Uh, I'm making cap since uh, more than 20 years. Uh, my favorite kite is uh, mine, uh, Rocker. Uh, camera, generally I use uh, the Rico GR. Uh, I'm living in Italy, northern Italy, and my area is uh, more or less this. All right, welcome. Next up, uh, Peter. Peter Van I, yeah. <clears throat> Peter Boyton. I am Malman on the CAP forum. I've been capping since 2007. I use mainly Rico cameras, thanks to Pierre's suggestion a couple of many years ago. My favorite kites are the Doperos. I have a brand new one from Mike Jones. He's calling it the 333. Really an amazing kite. Great for low wind. I'm ready to take you on, Pierre, with your R11. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Peter. And uh, next up would be Peter Van Eckel. Eckel. Hi, Errol. I'm Peter Van Eckel, located in the middle of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I wish you all a very happy cap year and a successful 2022. <laughs> Absolutely. I started flying kites when I was very young, so 1960. Started camping in 81. I'm a retired electronical engineer. My favorite kite is the kite on hand that is flying that day. Uh, the most used camp kite is the Rokaku. Second would be a roller. Third would be my very old parafoil I made in 81. It's a Yalbear 7.5. Cameras, I use many. At the moment, is the one on end, which is very simple, an iPhone. <laughs> Good. All right, thank you, Peter. Next up, Ken. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Ken Conrad. I live in uh, Seattle in the U.S., up in the northwest corner. Um, let's see. Uh, I've been capping since the mid-'90s. Believe it or not, I... Uh, Encourage Brooks Leffler to uh, teach his first cap building, cap rig building class, and that turned into Brooks.com. Nine years ago, I bought Brooks's uh, business, Brooks.com. I'm a um, I'm a lurker on the forum. I got to say, I don't have a handle. I'm not much of a, a, a forum person. I uh, correspond lots by email, and when you need a rig part, I probably still have it. Uh, my favorite kite is a kite that flies in the conditions we have now. I, um, my favorite cameras are the Olympus cameras. I, I love them. They're, they're ubiquitous on eBay. You can get a great lens inexpensively. Uh, they're lightweight. And uh, I like to tinker, and the Olympus cameras are pretty easy to tinker with. Um, I had... A cap experience that comes to mind is uh, flying a levitation delta uh, here in Seattle on a thermal. And the kite went from uh, about 300 feet up to 800 feet in a matter of a minute, flying straight up overhead. It was one of the best cap flights I've had. Uh, it, you know, it was, uh, I had to be totally present to keep the kite in the air and uh, to manage my rig. 
uh, ended up with some phenomenal photos. Um, look forward to the next time I can cap with you guys and in a real get together. Till then. All right, great. Thanks, Ken. Next is Dan. Hello, I'm uh, Dan Prosser, or you may know me as Montag Dude on the forum. Um, don't ask me how I came up with that screen name. Uh, I'm not sure I know. Um, I am. I'm living in Lexington Park, Maryland, in the United States. Um, so it's like the southern part of Maryland, about an hour and a half south of Washington D.C. Um, I'm an aerospace engineer. Um, I've been doing CAP for about a year and a half. I I picked it up along with kite building during the pandemic. Um, the story there is somehow I got interested. I, I like most people, I flew kites when I was a kid. Um, my grandfather was really into kites. Um, and I kind of stopped for a while, got interested again, and built some uh, like dowel and plastic kites. Um, and then I wanted to start taking aerial photos. So um, during the pandemic, I uh, learned how to use a sewing machine and I built some kites and started capping. So that's, that's when I started. It's been a lot of fun. Um, my favorite kite for cap is the rocker, which Sandro, I know is going to talk a lot about. Um, I built one of those based on his posts on the forum and it's been working really well. Um, and then my favorite cap camera at the moment is a Sony RX zero which uh, I'll be talking about that during my, my, whatever, my time. So I won't go too much into it, but this is my first Cappy Zoom. So it's nice to meet everybody. All right, welcome. All right, next up is on the label here is BN Chagney. You have to unmute yourself, yeah. There you go. Hello? We can hear you, go ahead. Um. Um, my full name is Bernard Noel. No, okay. I practice CAP. I, I don't speak English very good. It's very bad. Very bad. I practice CAP. I, I, I write and translate before. I uh, practice CAP since uh, 1983. I live, look, old man. I live in, I live in France and uh, uh, I use uh, Rokaku, big, small, uh, and my rig carries a big digital uh, Canon EOS, still um, a 760. Don't, uh, it's very heavy, yes, but uh, Rokaku are very big. Um, <laughs> I, I work uh, with archaeologists and biologists in many countries. Um, uh, Egypt, uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, Crete, um, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, well, um, but uh, but uh, until seven years, my kites take uh, a big summer holidays, <laughs> and uh, I use a very often drone. I have three drones uh, because uh, the wind is. I work very often in Sudan, and in Sudan, the 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 wind of the north is quietly no more present and uh, when to, you have to get result it's uh, imperative to use uh, no more kites and run uh, 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 three years ago I, I don't use more my kites <laughs> it's okay welcome yes. Yes. but uh, I, I use them with my 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 kind, uh, my, my petit enfant, children. Yep. Yep. Well, good. That's important. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Yvonne. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Yvonne Haché. Uh, on the forum, it's Yvonne with an H at the end there. Um, I started camping in 2004. Yeah, so it's been uh, 18 years roughly. Um, <clears throat> my uh, favorite kites, I, I tried to find kites over the years, Rokeku, uh, Flowform. The one I'm using the most is a kind of a 
big delta, a 12 foot depth delta that I designed. It's, it's a mix of conine, delta, and a few other things combined together. It's really quick to set up. I made two, and I can tie them and tan them if the wind is too light. So I get double the pole with the two kites. Uh, another kite that I like is a cap fold that I made. It's a, a 50 square foot kite. Pulls really good in high wind. Uh, my favorite cameras are the one I have on hand right now. It's a Canon T4i. It's getting old, but it's still working. And I have a Sony A5000, I think it is. And uh, that's it. Good, thank you. Welcome, uh, Paul. Oh, uh, wait, I forgot to say, uh, I'm from Dieppe, New Brunswick, in Canada. Yep, you're probably getting a little bit of snow. A lot, with a lot of wind. <laughs> yes. Hi, Paul. Hello, everybody. Paul Costello from Western Massachusetts. I've been flying kites uh, since for 32 years. My wife introduced me to two line stunt kites, and until I saw and added an Into the Wind catalog for one of Brooks's kits, I just did stunt kites. Then I went into Brooks's kits full bore, bought all the tools, followed the directions to the T, bought the radio control, and then started to take his advice and work backwards a little bit and keep things a little simpler, auto cap rigs and so forth. So I've been capping for probably 17 years, I would say. Um, my, my name, by the way, on the forum is Paul Costello. Um, favorite kites, it's kind of what's at hand. I love Delta coins, Sutton 16s, but my favorite is the Delta Levy now. Um, I have one of Mike's spreaders, which I haven't mastered yet, but in the interim, I've traveled with it with a center spar and adjustable lengths on the outside. So it gives me a very versatile kite, easy to pack and pulls when it needs to. Some people say it looks like it hurts. I don't mean to hurt the kite, but it sure works hard. And they are replaceable. Um, currently, since I'm not getting any younger, one of my interests is building a reel similar to Jim's Stratus pools and so forth that's more adaptive to older wrists, older forearms, and arthritic people like me. Still got to have fun, though. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say at the moment. I feel very grateful to be in such good company and keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, Dave. Dave Mitchell. And you're still muted, Dave, if you can unmute yourself. Pretty right. Okay, right. Um, my name's Dave Mitchell. I used to be Dave, I think, on the forum, but since it um, shifted from uh, Berkeley, um, uh, I'm now admin. I took over from Chris. I've actually followed Chris a lot. Sorry, is it too loud? Um, no, I'm just saying thank you for being the admin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll hail the admin. Yeah, I, anyway, I, I followed Chris all the way. I started off with um, Sutton Flow Forms. I still got Sutton Flow Forms, a whole load of other kites, but I fly them most of the time. I started off with Canons like Chris. I've had lots of Canon cameras, I guess. At the moment, I probably fly the S100 more than my EOS uh, M. Um, uh, I've been flying kites. Well, I'm possibly the oldest person here. I'm, I'm coming up to 81, um, certainly flew clients, kites before I was 10. Uh, and um, I feel slightly guilty. Uh, some of you may know there's a, somebody on the forum called NZ Flyer, uh, whose real name is Jim Nichols. And he and I were at school together. I've known him since we were both five. <laughs> and uh, I visited him, him in New Zealand in 2009 when he hadn't even heard of kites. And he's now got hundreds of them just because <laughs> I flew some some kites uh, when I was there. So blame me for all of Jim, Jim Nichols's uh, videos. Uh, not much else to say. I have to say this last year I've done very little, well, this last, yeah, 12 months, very little cap. I've somehow switched my attention to other things. I'm 
currently, um, if you ever want to learn Latin, uh, this is the book. <laughs> it's about 300 pages long. Apart from a few words on the back page, the whole 300 odd pages is entirely in Latin. It aims to teach you Latin the natural way. Uh, wonderful book. I, I really do recommend it. Anyway, um, and I've also been reverting to my life in the 80s and revising a book I wrote then and a whole load of other things. So not much cap these, year, these times, partly because the weather hasn't been wonderful, but also because um, I had prostate cancer a couple of years ago and I'm still suffering somewhat from the uh, hormone injections you have to take if you have prostate cancer. I'm recovered, but I'm not exactly male anymore. I have zero testosterone. So with any luck, next month, I'll start getting testosterone, testosterone and stop having, having hot flushes and all those things that come, uh, come with not having testosterone. Anyway, nice to see you all. Thank you, Dave. And again, thank you for your work on the forum and before you, certainly for Chris. All right, next up is Sue and Ken. <laughs> well, uh, hi, uh, Ken was on for a start, but he's, he's gone home. His um, tolerance to cap is fairly low, <laughs> but it does help me. Um, I'm just looking at me. Um, oh, I live in uh, Hull, Yorkshire, in England, and uh, uh, the um, the kite I've uh, taken to cost me twenty pound on eBay, and it's about the size of the levy, but it seems to be better behaved, except it does need a tail. And I detest tails. And um, this is the one that I started out, and that was my favourite for a lot of years. It's a Flowform 24. And I've got its younger brother, Flowform 14, as well. And the last couple of times we've been out, I've flown, it's gone, um, the Yorkshire Flowform, uh, which I made. Um, and I make that within 10 years, I think. And it's got a Yorkshire rose on it. I just didn't have a photo, it's gone. Um, my favourite uh, camera um, is the Ricoh GR, but also this, it's a waterproof camera, Pentax uh, w, WG4, Pentax. And it doesn't, its lens doesn't come out, so that's good for um, on sand and um, uh, and over water because it's waterproof but it's out um, video out would be underneath it at the bottom so that's useless and I've just bought this little tiny camera it's a Cadix and I'm going to mount it next to the the, uh, the W uh, the waterproof camera um, it's, it's about a centimetre and a half across. It's amazing. I thought I'm going to get a yellow one, but I didn't. And, um, and that camera gives really good, uh, good quality colour. Uh, we flew it at Fuerteventura in November and uh, all the colours were true and um, nothing seemed to be too bright. So um, I'm pleased with the colour of that. With the Ricoh GR, it always seems a bit dull or blue. I don't know if anyone's uh, any suggestions about getting it um, better, a better colour, um, brighter colour. Um, what else was there to say, Jim? Uh, Favourite kite. I think you already said that, yeah. I think them. you're good. I think you're good. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sue. Next good up to is see Carl. people here. Yep, next up is Carl. And you have to uh, unmute yourself, Carl. We can't hear you. All right, there we go. All right, yep, can you hear good. me? Yep. All right, my name is Carl Bigra. I'm from uh, Ottawa, Canada, in Ontario, province of Ontario. And um, my first kite, uh, my first cap experimentation was probably 1989 with a um, uh, with a plastic uh, flow form, a, w a very wobbly kite for it so um i got a lot of nothing uh from a roll of 36 
So, uh, so I had to join a kite club to learn about kites and kite flying and stability. And that was a, a great ex uh, experience uh, over the years. Uh, so I moved on and built a lot of rigs, including uh, one of Brooks's rigs uh, from uh, an old steam bent cedar wood I had. And then I've moved back into uh, steam bending cedar uh, for making lightweight uh, cap rigs. And um, there's some on my Flickr account, uh, goes under the name of Capper Carl. I'm sure some of you have already seen them. And um, uh, my forum name was Carl in the old forum, but I haven't joined the new one yet. So I'm sorry, David, I'll, I, I gotta do that at some time, busy guy. So I've been uh, retired for about six years uh, as a professional photographer in the conservation of uh, artwork and uh, imaging science of all sorts. And uh, my favorite kites are uh, the Rokaku six feet and a super lightweight uh, eight footer I built for about at about 450 grams with sticks. And, uh, and right now my pastime is uh, furniture building. Right. Thank you, Carl. All right. Next up, Cap Jassa. Jassa. Hi. Hi, all. Nice to see you. Um, my name is Sasha. I'm a member of Cap Jassa Kite Club. This is also the name on the forum. Um, we started doing Cap in 2007. Um, our favorite, my favorite kite is Rokaku because of its stability and, and everything. Um, the favorite camera is a similar to Sue's uh, Pentax VG10 waterproof camera that has been modified so it can detect infrared light. It views it for various scientific projects like archaeology or ecology, pollution monitoring and the like. Um, I'm from Ljubljana, Slovenia. Um, and this is pretty much that's it. All right, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Indiana is a beautiful city, so uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Amish, you can go next. Here you go. I, I'm Hamish Fenton from um, near Oxford in England. Um, I've been doing kite aerial photography since 2008. Um, my favorite kite is probably 2.4 meter Rokaku. Um, following that, um, probably the Southern Flow Form 16, which is actually probably my longest, um, my, my longest lasting kite, which I've had since 2009, and all the other ones have been replaced in, in, in intervening time. Um, fa favorite camera is the Panasonic GX1, which is interchangeable lens, with a 28 millimeter equivalent lens I have on that as my normal lens, but then I also fly the um, 50 millimeter equivalent and the 85 millimeter equivalent prime lenses. Good. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, next up would be James, as in Gentles. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. My name's James Gentles. So I'll bring that so that you would uh, recognize me. I used to be called James on the forum, and that was when it was run by somebody really good and who could get yourself a passport really quickly. But um, when I needed to use the forum recently, I needed to get be called Gentle Ed because, uh, and I still can't use it properly, Dave, because uh, unfortunately you haven't uh, let me, uh, we'll discuss that later. I don't want to embarrass Chris because I let him in, don't want to tell him all the stories about how bad the admin is now. <laughs> All right, and then how long have you been okay. doing uh, Yeah, I'm just uh, looking for my notes now. Yeah, where, you want to know where I was from? I'm from Edinburgh, which is in Scotland in the United Kingdom. And I've been doing career photography since uh, 2002, which takes me back to roughly when that picture was taken. Yeah. That will keep everybody guessing. Favourite kite is a Dupero, and that's because it has the Scottish flag on it. And the um, favourite camera is probably at the moment the uh, Hero 3 Plus because I use that most frequently because it's AutoCap and it, I use it as part of a camera array. And uh, 
that's all from Edinburgh at the moment. Back to you, Jim. All right. Thank you very much, James. And next up is Pierre. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Pierre Lesage. I'm located in uh, Tahiti, in uh, French Polynesia, halfway between Los Angeles and uh, Sydney. Uh, I started capping in 2005, mostly because I, <clears throat> I wanted to follow the construction of a hotel in Barbar, and that was uh, the only way to do it uh, at, at a reasonable price. Um, my favorite kites are deltas. Uh, the first one is the Delta R8 from, uh, from Dan Lay. That's uh, a travel edition that uh, Dan uh, built for me back in 2009. Uh, <clears throat> and I also fly the R11. Uh, I recently tried the Rocker. I still need to fine tune it, uh, but still it, it looks like a, like a great type. Um, the cameras I'm using most, uh, most of the time is the Ricoh GR with, um, with a wide angle. Uh, and the beauty of it is you have 21 millimeter um, uh, wide, uh, it's a, uh, equivalent to 21 millimeter uh, and 35 uh, uh, millimeter. Um, and uh, the APS-C sensor uh, gives some really great results. Also use the GoPro 3 and also the Insta 1R that has a one inch sensor uh, and that weighs only 100 grams. That's it for me. All right, thank you, Pierre. Uh, all right, next up, uh, Emmanuel. Mm. There you go. We can hear you. Hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to to meet this wonderful uh, event. Um, I started CAP in uh, 2004. Uh, with uh, the, the meaning to, to make aerial picture of a trip. And uh, I made it with the chance of the beginners, maybe. <laughs> uh, my favorite kite um, is uh, Dopero, 3.2 meters wide. And um, I only fly a compact camera, power shot, S110, and sometimes, sometimes um, a little uh, micro four third uh, Lumix. Really good, but uh, I a little bit scared uh, to fly it. <laughs> um, in uh, 2005, uh, I think, um, I launched the French Cap Forum. And um, I received a, a CAPI award uh, during CAPINED in uh, 2010, and I'm very proud of it, even if I'm not for anything for the success. The success is for the members, and I thank them. Um, I usually uh, do CAP uh, in trips. And uh, since two years, uh, I think you know why I don't make a lot of cap. cap. But um, there's in France um, an event uh, called uh, Comme un nuage, like a cloud. And it's a, a festival uh, where some, some cappers, French, but not only, uh, meet expose pictures, uh, meet the public, uh, do demonstrations. It's a really interesting event. I think I answered of many questions. <laughs> I hope I, I don't forget one. Thank you, Jim, for the... No, you did a good job, Emmanuel. All right, next up is Christoph from France. He just joined, he just joined the... Zoom call a few minutes ago. So Christoph, if you can hear us and you wish to introduce yourself, we're just doing introductions to give us your name and your location, uh, your favorite, how long you've been doing CAP, your favorite uh, kite and favorite camera. <laughs> so Christoph, if you want to introduce yourself and 
it's possible that Christoph is is not uh, in front of his screen because yeah. uh, he had children and it's the time to to get yeah. to, to bed. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'll uh, move ahead then, and uh, I'll just give you my introduction. So, Jim Powers, otherwise known as Wind Watcher, on the forum, been doing CAP since around 2000, so almost 22 years now. Um, join every minute of it. Uh, favorite kite, uh, the most frequent kite is, is definitely the levitation delta uh, with a dynamic spreader from, from Mike. Uh, thank you again, Mike. Uh, and the reason that kite is, is the favorite is because it's the most used. And I used to travel every month for work. And after work, I go fly kites. Um, and I'm not working overseas anymore. But uh, anyway, that's still the kite that I fly the most. Uh, the camera that I use the most is probably the uh, Sony A6000. You guys are probably, I don't know if this shows up on the screen, it does not. Let me get rid of my uh, background, one second. Um, I can find where it's at. Video, one second. Get rid of my virtual background. No. It's gone. Yeah. So it's just the uh, A6000 Sony um, on a simple auto cap rig uh, is what I use. And I use the uh, in-app camera um, app uh, time lapse in addition to having a camera remote that actually actuates the pan and tilt. Uh, and then also I spent starting to spend a little bit of time with this new cap rig. And that's the rig, GoPro on a string. And it's just uh, a GoPro Hero 10. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this in, in a talk in, in a few minutes. And then when the wind doesn't blow, doing one of these guys, um, I got my commercial FAA license to fly drones. And uh, so when the wind's not blowing, I still like to take pictures from above and uh, I'll stick one of those up in the air. Um, all right, so I think, has anyone not given us the introduction? Right? And I know it took us almost an hour of our precious time to go through the introduction. But to me, this is probably one of the more important parts of this Zoom call is just to get to know the people. So I'm not a, uh, we, we may have to adjust our timing and schedule a little bit, but I'm still think this is the most important part. So if you have your adult beverage, please join me in a uh, toast to uh, good cap times coming in 2022. You know, may all of your pictures come out well. You don't lose any kites like me and may this darn uh, COVID pandemic finally ease uh, on the human population where we can join and uh, meet each other again at some kite festivals uh, later this year. So cheers. All right. And what I'd like to do next, um, adjusting the schedule here a little bit, is I wanna bring up, keep everyone on your toes, bring up uh, James. And I want to have a toast to James uh, with his, all the tech that he's supplied to many of us cappers uh, on this call. Uh, and I know you just recently announced that you're backing out of this business. So we thoroughly appreciate all that you've done. A toast to you. And I hope that everyone get in, get in your last bit orders before he runs out. So James, it's up to you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. I have, uh, do you, you did, we didn't see your agenda, um, Jim. Do you want me to, uh, I've got something prepared we can uh, go over for, try and keep it yeah. down to under five minutes? Yeah, you're up. And uh, okay. I, I'm, uh, James indicated he, he might have to leave a little bit early, so I wanted to jump him to the top of the list. And uh, so James, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and, um, hopefully has better results than me trying to share my screen. So uh, go ahead. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a green button kind of on the bottom of your screen. There you go. We can see it. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. It's 18 years since the term gent led uh, hit the, uh, the CAP community, uh, a conglomeration of my name and the LED technology, which was the infrared triggers that was first uh, started by uh, Myself and uh, and Peter Bultz, and um, I'm just going to very briefly uh, give you a little bit of uh, 
what I've been doing over the last 18 years, apart from making 30,000 gent leads. <laughs> and uh, we'll start up with a little quiz. Um, if we can get this to actually change slide. Um, does anybody know who these two gentlemen are flying a kite? Wilbur and Oval. Well done. Wright, Wright brothers. Uh, well done. Uh, I thought this audience would get that right. Usually the audience doesn't get that right. But I'm showing this slide. It's not the, the, the picture you normally see of the first flight of uh, uh, a manned powered flight. But I just think this is a fantastic image to demonstrate the crossover. These guys were learning all about kites, a two-line kite here, so that they could make an aeroplane fly. So that is the connection in my book between aeroplanes and the society we live in that relies on aeroplanes and uh, the, the kites, because this is not an aeroplane. This is a kite. The other thing that we need is a camera. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? And I don't think uh, we're allowed an answer from um, Dave Mitchell. Is it Dave Mitchell? It's not <laughs> a good answer. <laughs> um, Dave Wheeler? This is a, it's, it does look like Dave Wheeler, doesn't it? It's a guy yeah. called Steve Sasson who works for um, a company called Kodak. Anybody know what he invented? He's holding it in front of you. Digital camera. First that digital is correct. Camera. Yes, that is the very first digital camera. It's a kind of concept thing because it uh, it's not really very portable, but it is a digital camera. It's got a, an old fashioned cassette deck on the back on the right there to record the photographs, and <laughs> it, it, all the elements of a digital camera are there. That's in 1975. He worked for Kodak, and of course, Kodak failed the uh, the, uh, the the transition between wet. Uh, photography and uh, digital photography but um, that's the first digital camera believe it or not it never flew on a kite but it was about 20 18 to 20 years ago that uh, this camera here was the first one I ever flew it took this picture of a, an ancient burial mound which uh, I have been at several times and uh, one or two people in the forum have been here there as well including um, Hamish Fenton and um, Pierre I think has also been there this is a camera I first flew it's a joke now, but that's the picture it took, and that's what got me hooked on kite aerial photography. And that's what got me thinking about, if we could all just trigger our shutters and do auto cap, this is what we would need to do it. And uh, this is the Gent Light Auto, which I'm sure quite a few of you have got here, and I'm hoping it's still doing serv sterling service for you. Yes, I get one for Sudan, yes, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, and that's me doing some testing again at, at Cairn Papel. And I took that especially, put, added that especially for Pierre, because uh, Pierre has been sending me pictures of Cairn Papel over the last few, uh, few days, I think, as we it's discussed old times. More recently, I've been flying this because I too have stayed with AutoCAP. I've given up with all the, uh, the, the video assist. And for an old veteran like me, this is the best camera because it is a panoramic camera, sees in all directions, so you can edit the photograph you want later because it is all seeing in all directions. And that's the kind of photograph it takes. That's a picture of uh, Elan Glass, one of the first four lighthouses in Scotland. And um, that's on the uh, Outer Hebrides uh, on, the, uh, on, a, on a peninsula. You can see the, the peninsula in the foreground and the island of Scalpy is, is in the background. And that's looking north to uh, an area called Harris, where Harris Tweed comes from. And this is a, a very low-lying part of the country. I've included this photograph for our Dutch friends on the line tonight. And this is a, a very wet and patchy wilderness. This is an area called South Uist in Scotland. Uh, the other thing, of course, you can do with uh, panoramic photography is you can... Uh, bend the pictures the way you want. This is a, a condominium, I think you call them in the States, a block of housing in, uh, in Scotland, about a mile from where I live. And um, not quite sure why it does this, but uh, That's neat. it just demonstrates the kind of things that you can do. Um, Mr. Van Erkel, have you any idea who this is in uh, trying to simulate here in the black and white etchings oh, type thing? Oh, the old gentleman called Mr. Escher. Yeah. Well done. I'm glad you got that right. I'll just keep going. 
What you're doing is so much more advanced. Talking about advanced, Peter, um, I thought I'd add this in as well, because um, I think a lot of us on this forum are, are experimenters, and I think that's a great tribute to us all. Uh, this is something that not I, but actually Simon Harvard experimented with as far back as 1999. These are my photographs, but Simon introduced me to this thing called Canoma Graphics, which uh, is no more. You aligned various boxes. You can see green and yellow boxes uh, on, on the screen. And the thing would basically generate for you this kind of three-dimensional thing. We're all very familiar with this these days, but 20 years ago we weren't. And you could generate this kind of rather mm -hmm. grainy picture of, of a, a house with a, with a green roof. Now, the amazing thing about this is this is 23 years old, this, uh, this program. Mm -hmm. um, these pictures are only about 15 years old. The quality is not very good at all. But this just demonstrates that uh, Peter, people like Simon and, and others on this forum were experimenting with all sorts of things mm -hmm. um, over the last 25 years and longer. And I think that is, uh, is really fantastic. This little house here does indeed have a green roof. Uh, it's on an island of Tyree and it's called Green Gables, believe it or not. Uh, and that has about 100 to 200 facets or faces that you've, you've just seen. Can I introduce you to another one of our, uh, our number? Um, this uh, little film was put together by uh, a chap called, oh, my, my memory's going now, Kieran Baxter. And Kieran Baxter discovered that uh, an Italian gentleman had taken a balloon trip from Champagny in uh, just underneath Mont Blanc. That's Mont Blanc in the background there. And he took a large format plate camera with him and he took all these pictures. I know it's a balloon, it's not a kite, but Bear with me. I took this photograph, believe it or not, um, of Mont Blanc, and it demonstrates the, the flight from Chamonix that this uh, Italian gentleman took. What Kieran managed to do was he managed to take this relief picture of the, the Alps and take the 12 plate photographs and paint them on to the relief picture wow. and developed a 3D model of the Mont Blanc Massif. And you've just seen the balloons go past. And we can now effectively go up this um, mm. glacier as if it was a real glacier. And this is exactly the kind of thing that I see folks in this forum doing in terms of looking out of the box and looking at doing things differently. Kieran wasn't content with just doing that. This is Kieran in the foreground. Kieran had helicopter and he took himself to the 12 positions exactly geo-referenced to where these photographs have been taken before. So he now has a complete set of 2017 and 1909 pictures. And what this demonstrates is the amount of mass that the glaciers underneath Mont Blanc have lost. You can see that's mm. mixing between one and the other. And if nobody thinks that we're gonna have any uh, problems with uh, global warming, then they should think again. So I thought, if Kieran can do this, I can do this, because this is a, 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 a small church in the Western Isles, and this is not a photograph. This was taken from about 40 kite photographs that I took myself, and then threw them together into this technology, and out came this. So I'm not claiming this is new or modern, but I'm just saying this is the kind of thing that uh, I see as being the future, and the kind of things that everybody on this uh, call tonight can potentially work on and can add to. And compared with 25 years ago, you can see we have uh, millions of points and millions of facets here rather than just uh, a few hundred in the previous picture. So over the last 20 years, I'd like to thank you all for buying the products which I've made. I am retiring. I'm hopingly not retiring from Kite Aerial Photography and I'm still going to be around the forum, but uh, the shop shuts on Monday. And uh, this is not a call for last orders. It's a call to say thank you very much indeed for previous orders. And a last question to you all. What is the difference between a good and a bad photographer? Any takers? Yeah, the good one doesn't show the bad pictures. You've <laughs> heard this before, haven't you, Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm glad you remembered it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And uh, whether I appear as Gentled or James, I will be around the forum as long as Dave lets me in after I badmouth him <laughs> in front of everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, James. James. Uh, I have to duck out, I'm afraid. It's all right. And if uh, James, you can stop sharing. There we go. Um, all right, so we got to jump into the agenda now, and um, uh, I want to move right into uh, the agenda that was partially up on the screen behind me, but now it's not. Um, so Mountain Dew with uh, uh, the new RC cap rig for the Sony RX Zero. If you can uh, go ahead and share your screen or just share what you would like to share. And again, you're more, everyone's more than welcome to share your screen, run a video, however you want to do it, or just speak. It's up to you. So there's no requirement about how to get your point across. And just a heads up, we are running a little bit late, um, and we're just going to keep going. So uh, relax, like, let's roll. I would like to show something about the CUP meeting on FANU. All right. Yeah, we have a, a section on the agenda to, to cover uh, CAP meetings and certainly want to hear about Fano. I'm hoping to get there this year. So, uh, but Matt Gu, uh, Dan, if you can go ahead and present and share your screen and then, uh, um, let's see. Does it open? Yeah, all right, so Wolfgang, you're sharing now? Yeah. Okay. All right, so Matt and Gu, you'll come up after Wolfgang. Oh, sorry. No problem. That's okay, that's fine. Do you see Yes, we do. Screen? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the third uh, cup meeting will take place in June. And uh, Pierre, Lesage, and I, we will stay from Friday 10th to Tuesday 28th. Uh, the reason is just in the week in front of midsummer, the International Kite Flyers meeting will happen. And uh, even when we had COVID the last year and the year before, there were maybe three to 5,000 kite flyers. Um, it's a meeting, so you always have to organize yourself by renting a holiday house or bed and breakfast. I am uh, always stay on the camping place. And the camping place Redguard um, offers a workshop room. Uh, they have a restaurant, they have internet for free. So they try to help us as uh, good as possible. Uh, the island of Farnö seems to be small with 10 kilometer length but all about it, need, it needs years to find out uh, all the beauty and the uh, fine locations like the Sea Rose Lake here. Uh, here we are on the southern end of Fane where there is a memorial for the seafarer and we see a sea bark or a landmark and we see the windmill, and uh, some of you may already uh, have seen our pictures, Pierre's and mine. We made several sessions here, and it's always fun. Uh, when you reach the island of Fane, you will uh, reach Nord B. I made a panorama shot, and I do not uh, show kites here, they are flying about nine kilometers forth, uh, north of the southern tip of Fanu. And when I made this panorama, I was not satisfied with the uh, movement of the rotation of my rig. So I just uh, replaced this MIDI servo HS 85 mg and it's running now quite smooth and so i expect to get more experience with the next seven and of course i use the gentlet 
I reduced uh, the rig for two parts, one square, I call it PKW platform. It's not anymore a cross, but a platform. And the special uh, line guiding depends to Ralf Beutnagel, who invented the Dopero, and he called it uh, type Rendsburg. And the advantage of this uh, line guiding is the central place of the uh, PKW platform is free. And I, the second part of metal I use now to make this panorama uh, shots is this L-formed metal piece. That's all. And so let's hope to meet you on Farne here. After many years, I succeeded to uh, get the sunset exactly on midsummer. And anyway, you will not forget the uh, you will not forget the experiences you will have uh, on Farne. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Wolfgang. And uh, I know you're going to be there from June the 10th to June the 28th uh, in the yeah. International Kite Festival in the middle. Uh, if you can't stay that long, what are the best days for cappers to join you? Yes, that's the reason uh, we don't want to um, say uh, come for the weekend. Uh, the vacation time is limited, so uh, we will be for a long time to share all experience with friends, uh, depending on their time. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for Wolfgang before we go to Dan? Let's okay. go right then to Dan. And again, we'll just have to keep everyone, keep it five, ten minutes short, if you can, uh, and we'll go right to Dan. All right, uh, I'll, I should be able to keep it pretty short. Um, so I'm gonna start off sharing my screen, hopefully. Um, and I will show you the design of this rig. Um, so last year I built a rig that was a lot like this and I got to use it once. Um, and then the second time out had a mishap and it ended up in a lake. <laughs> um, I did recover it, but it didn't work anymore. Um, so after that, I switched to an auto cap rig, um, which has worked well for me, has not ended up in any lakes, um, but I kind of got a hankering to do an RC one again, um, just because there are a lot of times when I wish I could see what I'm taking a picture of and be able to control it. Um, so I am using, so this is, this CAD software is called FreeCAD. It is open source. Um, and it is free, as the name suggests, and it actually, it really works quite well. Um, and I'm using the same kind of construction that I have done for years when I did radio-controlled airplanes, Oops. Um, using laser-cut wood construction. So this is designed out of three millimeter plywood. Um, and I like it because I can compared to working with metal or something, I can make the everything um, exactly the shape I want and precision cut. Um, I don't do the cutting myself, but I send it out to someone else who does it. Um, but anyway, the idea behind this design, it's got a kind of standard pitch um, and panning motion. And then I have a servo to do the shutter. This is my Sony RX0 camera. Um, which I really like this camera, it, and actually you'll see the real thing in a minute, um, but it looks like a GoPro or a, um, you know, something like that, but it's actually a much better stills camera than it is a video camera. Um, it has a, a, a one inch sensor, which is quite big for a compact camera. It's not, not quite the size of like an APS-C, but it's bigger, a lot bigger than your standard compact camera. Um, and the thing that is really nice about this is that it only weighs, I think, 110 grams. So it's super small and light and takes great pictures. Um, I posted some of them up on the cap page for this meeting. Um, if you look through, you'll see some of them. Um, so I'm really happy with it. Uh, and let's see, like Sue, I have a little um, 
first person view kind of like drone camera here that I'm using for the video downlink, since I don't think there's any good way to get the video stream out of the camera itself. Um, but this thing is light uh, and I think it, I think it works well. I also, so normally these things come with like ultra wide angle lenses. Um, and this, the Sony RX zero has a 24 millimeter equivalent field of view. Um, so I was able to get a, I was able to find a slightly longer focal length lens for this camera um, and tested it out. And it seems to be pretty close to the field of view of the, the main camera. So I think that'll work out well. Of course, it doesn't need to be perfect or anything. Um, and let's see, I'm using a little lithium battery, a two cell lithium polymer, which gives you about seven or eight volts. Um, the construction is all interlocking, so it's really easy to build this. Um, I also have this additional little servo on the top, and the reason for that is to turn on and off the video, the video feed from the FPV camera, um, since that does use up a lot more battery than just the servos themselves. So I, I like to have that off when I don't actually need it. Um, that way I can use a, a quite small battery for the whole thing. Um, and here are, this is what the wood parts look like. Um, so I sent this out to a laser cutter and got it back and I have, let me see, I will stop sharing. Um, and so here I was able to build this in the last week or so. Uh, so it worked, it's worked out pretty well. It's, it's mostly functioning now. I need to, I haven't, um, put in the shutter servo yet because I need to buy a new one of those. Um, but I have, here's the RX zero camera. So as you can see, it's quite small. Let me move it back so you can see the whole size of this thing for a fully functional rig is quite small. Um, this, I don't, I don't have everything on it yet, but it's like 95% of the way there. And I think it, I weighed it in at 370 grams. Um, so quite small and light. Um, I don't know, I guess you can kind of see the construction a little bit if it'll focus on it, but yeah, quite enjoyable. And so I'm looking forward to getting it up in the air. Um, I think it'll be fun. But that's all I had, unless there's any questions about it. Yeah, any next up will be Sumac, but while we're Sumac is getting ready, uh, any questions for Dan? It looks great. I love that balsa wood cut stuff. So the, the inner frame is uh, absolutely square, so you can, you can alter uh, that for horizontal and vertical. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to mention it. Um, I intentionally made it square so that I can just, I, I would need to unscrew the servo and then unscrew this thing, and then I can just rotate the whole thing. And that's why there's this extra space here, just so it could be square. Um, but yeah, I, I had a, a few locations where I wanted to do some vertical orientation. So I did do that intentionally. All right, great, great presentation. Thank you for that. And Sandro, Sumac, you wanna give us uh, your okay. presentation? Let's try if I can share my screen. <coughs> Like it's starting. So I just uh, want uh, to show briefly uh, some experience about uh, the rock. Uh, I don't know. Uh, my internet connection at this uh, hour uh, is getting worse. So I hope that you can follow me. But uh, okay, the rock is a kite uh, uh, between a uh, rockaku and a roller. So there is uh, airflow that is going between uh, the main sail and the lower sail and uh, a wide opening that is getting wider and wider according to the strength of, one, of wind. Uh, this, this kite is born uh, uh, first prototype in August 2020. I'm coming from uh, construction of uh, many, many kites, so I have uh, at least uh, 10 uh, Rokaku uh, vented, uh, uh, three or four uh, before uh, this rock uh, uh, 
a good amount of deltas and the several doperos. The rocker has been uh, a bit a surprise because it has uh, a, it is covering a wind speed uh, that is uh, unbelievable. So I can fly uh, uh, from a range of two uh, uh up to a full five. Uh, when it, uh, this kite has been showing to be uh, particularly suitable for cap use because uh, you can take, uh, you can go up in the sky also in low wind condition. And uh, if uh, uh, you have the, the, the bad situation that the wind is getting stronger and stronger, you can still fly uh, at a good angle and with the feeling of stability. The kite is pulling for sure, but it's not pulling like uh, Rokakus. And uh, you can keep back uh, your camera. Uh, you can return home safely with uh, everything OK. Until now, I had uh, no problem at all. So no bad reaction from this kite. And uh, typically, uh, making cap, you can forget the kite. Uh, the kite is, uh, is taking care itself uh, of the, the changes uh, of wind direction and strength. We are in, in a place where the wind is changing uh, very fast and uh, in a way uh, mostly unpredictable. So I'm quite happy of this behavior. At the present moment, I have made uh, 13 kites in uh, something more than two years. Some of them are in Europe, two in Belgium, in France, in Poland, Slovenia, uh, one in Tahiti, someone is in Italy, a few are still in my hands. Uh, I feel that uh, this experience has been uh, quite surprising and also quite good for me. So in the last two years, uh, I'm flying almost only rock. Uh, I like very much doperos, but uh, uh, they are too complicated in assembly. So when you are on the place and you want to make a cup in short time, the dopero is uh, a drama. Uh, Deltas are very good guys, but uh, when they decide to go diving, uh, my God. Uh, and uh, Rokaku, I love so much Rokakus, but uh, when the wind is getting uh, stronger, Rokaku is, uh, uh, <laughs> is terrible because it is uh, deforming. Uh, flying very low, pulling uh, uh, at, uh, at an enormous level, so getting very, and you risk uh, to break uh, the frame and to have troubles uh, with your system. So this is basically what I wanted to say about uh, Rocker. I'm not so much uh, basing on my own experience only because I'm quite happy uh, that the people that had uh, in hands and their ex direct experience uh, were quite happy, basically. So I want to, to take the opportunity also to remind uh, a friend, uh, Blue Kai team, uh, that is uh, Piotr Madri uh, from Poland. He has made uh, a lot of very nice kites. Uh, he has done uh, really uh, a lot of very big doperos uh, and big rocks. Uh, he was going cap when just uh, uh, little leaves uh, were moving. He said, no, 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 there is uh, wind enough for, for capping. 
But uh, okay, he was getting out from home with his uh, 3.5 meter uh, Rocatu. I just want to say that uh, uh, people that uh, have uh, in, uh, in their hands uh, a, a kite from Piotr have really uh, a masterpiece because he was making so care and that tension ensuing that is uh, something out of mind, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, so uh, there are very nice people that are making good kites in a few hours. Uh, Piotr was making very good kites in one week and uh, it is uh, just a little bit different. Okay, for me, that's all. Thank you so much for uh, and uh, I stop the share. Yep, thank you very much. And I would second Pior's, uh, I have several of his large Rukuku uh, kites and they're, I was flying one yesterday and uh, they're very yeah, well yes. made and uh, they fly in a whisper of wind. Uh, Sandra, one quick question for that, for the Roker kites that you have built. Have you ever explored putting a spring on the lower bridle to lift out the tail in addition to the venting that you do? Remember, I saw somebody. Uh, somebody not had... necessary. Okay, not necessary. All right. Oh. I have tested uh, something like that uh, on uh, Rokaku in the past, but uh, on Rock, uh, this is not necessary. The deformation of the kite uh, when the wind is increasing is already changing the inclination of the mainsail mainly, and mm -hmm. the kite still is flying at the high angle, uh, and so it is really uh, quite self-adaptive uh, to the situation. This is what I have seen until now from uh, direct experience. Yes, I can, I can speak. Uh, Peter Van Echel, um, um, show me the elastic bridle from my Rokaku, and uh, I have a very long bridle, and so I can uh, fly uh, with uh, plenty of uh, uh, winds uh, in Sudan. It's very, uh, I no more see my Rokaku so looping. Yes, thank you, thank you, Peter. Yes, but the painted uh, Rokakus, they all have the, the behavior that Santo is describing. If the wind is increasing due to the holes or to the slit, it's increasing the f angle of flight. And the bri elastic bridle does the same, but only for a closed uh, sail. If you have an open sail, the holes will do that. The, the fented Rokakus are really a pleasure to fly. Yep, I remember, Peter, you had one, and, and I yes, have one I also. Have a, I have several ones, the Holy One, uh, the Holy Man, the Grey Boy, some deviations, and they're really very nice to fly. So right. I, I think I may be the only other person who's built one of these, well, probably not, but um, these vented Rokakus, and that was based on Sandro's recommendation, and it is like, it's just super reliable. I can share a picture if you don't mind. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, just do it briefly. And while you're doing that, Andrea, uh, with historical cap, you'll be up next. So here's here's mine. It's a seven foot one. And in all the time I've been using it, I don't think I've even had a scare. It's just like you, you get it up there and it just flies and you don't need to worry about it pretty much. So that's all. All right, great. Uh, thank you for those presentations. All right, next up would be Andrea with historical cap and a compact GoPro camera system. There we go. We can see your screen. Go ahead. But we can't hear you. Anybody see Andrea uh, if he has his mic muted?
I can see the picture, but not uh, the voice. Okay, Can't... it's okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, I will there try. You yep, you're all good. Okay, so hello again. Uh, some of you know my activity. I started in 1993. I've been involved uh, the, in uh, historical research on kite and uh, historical kite aerial photography. So uh, today I will uh, uh, make a brief presentation of the achievement uh, made uh, in uh, recent years with my friend Fausto and promote historical research. And I hope someone interest this one. <clears throat> okay, some of the milestones in the evolution of kite aerial photography uh, have been reproduced by me and Fausto. I have a picture on the screen, sorry. And um, we can take a look uh, to some of this uh, millstone and um, I will show uh, to everyone uh, our experience. I think in the first uh, and most famous area of photography uh, was Batu, and um, who in uh, 1808 uh, took first uh, aerial photography or his house uh, and Laur. I think uh, many of you uh, know this one, these pictures. And um, this is was the uh, most famous uh, picture taken from Batu. And uh, the system of Batu uh, is uh, very original for this era. The first system uh, consisted in, the, in a kite with a good uh, frame. I made uh, this one. And uh, interesting uh, was uh, the bow because it uh, uh, was made by blades. And uh, we can see in other pictures how it's possible to uh, arc this part by means of uh, a blade. Also, uh, the camera uh, was uh, self-made and uh, very uh, interesting how Batu made the camera using a plywood and uh, a paper to reinforce all the parts. Also, the shutter was made by uh, Batu by himself and uh, use a, a rubber to move uh, uh, the shooter. And uh, uh, also, it's very interesting how um, Batu hang the camera to the kite frame. Uh, in the first solution, use a camera and a, and a system fixing directly on the kite frame. But many of you know the problem of uh, vibration uh, of the kite and uh, the blurring uh, photo. So in these pictures, we can see the arc made by mm. a sword and of course, all the system in flight. The first uh, solution of sale was made in paper and uh, the second one was made in uh, cotton. Also, we, we like to present uh, uh, an interesting solution of uh, William Eddy. William uh, Eddy uh, uh, was one of the first uh, that used a camera connected uh, and angled on the kite line and non directly to the wood frame. So also, uh, um, Eddie works uh, at Blue Hill Observatory. So uses the kite to lift uh, uh, instrumental and uh, sometimes to take pictures like this one. This one is one pictures taken from uh, Eddie and uh, the system, uh, was uh, very easy because I use uh, a, a frame suspended on the kite line and a camera. The camera uh, take uh, 
the shot, use a line from the ground, and you pull the line and take the pictures. In uh, many of this year, um, I found uh, a, a very interesting plan. It was a patent of uh, Eddie. I think uh, William Eddie never made this one, but uh, I love this kind of solution. So in many years, I decided to make exactly this replica. replica. And um, it's uh, composed from eight camera. I made uh, from the lens to the, cut, uh, to the camera and uh, also the shutter release. It's very complicated to make eight camera. This system uh, is interesting because you can take a, a panoramic pictures all around, uh, 716 degree, and uh, also you can move the camera looking from the ground. So you can take picture, exactly a photo of the plan, uh, of the plan view. All this camera was angled on the kite line, like the present one. And uh, another interesting project was uh, made uh, a replica, um, was a replica of the René Desclay. Uh, I like to remember Desclay because it was uh, uh, one of the most uh, years of activity in kite aerial photography. I think just before someone of us uh, this clay start in 1980 uh, and uh, works about 13 years. Takes a lot of pictures and made a system uh, with a very interesting uh, um, system of pendulum. We can see uh, the one of the first pendulum and uh, uh, you can see this parachute. This one needs to uh, prevent and reduce the movement of the pendulum. So if the pendulum move on the right, the parachute with the wind move on the left. So you can make all the system more uh, stable. Also for this uh, system, uh, me and my friend Fausto made um, a complete replica. You can see the pendulum, the camera, all the line here that move the parachute here and the wind used to reduce oscillation. This one is one of the most famous uh, picture taken from uh, uh, display. Also, all. Uh, we have made uh, a complete camera and uh, also the kite. We can see this uh, a little part of the kites. For the camera, it's interesting uh, the system to, uh, to take uh, the pictures. Uh, the camera was put uh, inside uh, of a wood box like this one. And uh, this box uh, is connected to the pendulum in uh, this uh, brass part. And uh, to take pictures, I use a um, fire, um, oh, I forget the name, but uh, uh, you have uh, a fire here. You, uh, in the first time, cut the line and the spring pull the shooter release system inside the camera. When you take the picture, a red flag is blowing and uh, uh, show on the ground that the picture was taken. Here, me and uh, a display uh, kite. Also, very interesting system, and I think uh, I like to call this one the most famous photographic system, uh, is the system on um, the Gomez catalog. Um, this system is most famous, but uh, uh, no one uh, has survived to the present day. So uh, we can uh, take uh, just, uh, we have just uh, some pictures like this one and uh, this one on the Gomez uh, catalog. And uh, this system took many years to study and research. 
and uh, uh, only thanks to our friends uh, Cotard, who photographed um, the sale present uh, in uh, the museum, uh, we can start to make a replica of this system. First, we can see a, a place, uh, it's most famous, this place. I think uh, some of you can recognize uh, this one. It's Batu, uh, it's Berk, and we can see the hospital, still today is the same position. And in, this, in uh, these pictures, we can see uh, Gomez on the ground. And uh, this part is a part of the system that I, I will uh, show to us. The system uh, consists in a messenger, the yellow sail, which uh, bring up uh, to the camera along the cable and uh, a trigger, uh, the same that we see in the um, aerial pictures. The trigger uh, is a red sail, uh, is brought uh, later. In the first time you lift uh, the um, messenger with the camera, and in the second time uh, you break up uh, um, the lifter, and uh, uh, this lifter is used to take the pictures. Why? When the messenger, the trigger arrive to the messenger, okay, um, we have a shock here, and all this system, it's a very complicated system, release a line, in the first time with the spring, release a line, and go to uh, a timer here, and after uh, shock, the trigger come back to the ground and the timer start to, lead, uh, to pull a second line here uh, that was used to take pictures, just not uh, in uh, exactly the same time when, uh, when the trigger uh, collapse, because uh, it's a, a delay uh, to prevent uh, the blurring uh, of during uh, the strike. It's very interesting, very complicated, all the system. Uh, I think it's very strange that uh, only one person can use this one. Uh, we have tried to take some pictures. Uh, at the moment, we haven't time to take uh, a, a really pictures. We have tested all the system, but uh, I'm sure needs uh, two person because one, uh, have to lift uh, uh, in the first time uh, all. Uh, in this picture, we can see the timer inside uh, a little box, uh, and uh, here, all the system, uh, uh, the messenger complete. So we have seen the sail, the timer, and all the system to connect uh, the camera. Also, um, like for the display and other one, we have make a, a kite. Aero photo is the guy that use it uh, uh, for um, take pictures. So we have a lot of next plan. We can help. Uh, we have made intention to make a replica of Sakone with a pick of its suspension. Also, we have uh, idea to make a Lawrence uh, panoramic uh, camera. Uh, many of you, I think, know this mega panoramic camera and also uh, the Roger Aubry automatic camera. This one is very interesting system because uh, uh, at the first of uh, 19th century, uh, this system can be controlled from the ground, can be take 10 pictures, and uh, you can move from the ground all the camera. That's I uh, left uh, with uh, any suggestion uh, are welcome. If someone has uh, an idea, we can try to make uh, uh, this uh, new system. And uh, also, if you are interested to see uh, something uh, uh, or more detail of the camera, of the system, uh, you can take a look uh, uh, on YouTube. I have a channel where I explain uh, some of this one and also in, uh, in my site. Uh, 
uh, that's all. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I haven't time to take a, to make a presentation about my GoPro compact wood camera. Uh, I have a lot uh, of, of work in this week, uh, so I make only this one uh, presentation. And uh, for this evening, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentation to see that history. And any quick questions before we move on? See, we got uh, Ninja Lu has joined us. A couple others may have joined in. Uh, just we're running a little bit late, but I'm going to keep going through the agenda we had published. Uh, next up would be Mike Iowa Capper with Airborne Data Logger. After Mike would be Pierre, just to give everyone a little heads up, and we'll keep pushing on. So, Mike, if you could share your screen, and uh, Andrea, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, and that will enable us to switch. Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, can you guys see the screen here with the, uh, is that visible to everybody? Yes. You can see it. Okay, so topic today we want to talk about, let me get, get up here for, um, is going to be talking about an airborne data logger, um, which is a device that you use to, to capture various types of information while you're flying. Um, and I've been playing around a lot with the, the, the Delta Kite, trying to come up with some optimizations for the, the uh, adaptive crossbar, or the, the DS we call it, um, and needed some kind of an objective way to, to, to kind of understand and, and compare the differences in the design. I really, really wanted to understand how wind speed and line tension and, and uh, line angle are all affected by the different variations with the goal to try to optimize the, the design to get a kite that that's, has a wider wind range and uh, kind of a tailorable um, amount of pull that you can put on it where you can actually kind of program it to, to regulate the, the amount of tension on the line. So I needed a, a device to, um, to be able to capture some of that data. So I started working on a, 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 a data logger, um, and that's basically um, something you hook onto the line, like I said, and, and, and uh, able to just record some various parameters. And I started out uh, with the, the, the initial prototype is able to, to capture the, uh, the, the line tension and the wind speed, and then uh, set it up to, to log the data into an ST card at about a two hertz rate. Um, and I've, I've been able to fly that uh, several times this last fall and kind of been working it out. I'm gonna be expanding it a little more for some more work on the spring. Um, high, real high level block diagram for, for anybody interested. It's, it's uh, built off of an Arduino, which is kind of a modular microprocessor uh, thing for homebrew uh, kind of um, make type people that like to do your DIY stuff. Um, so it's got a microprocessor on the Arduino. It's a real small, um, like a one inch by uh, like an inch and a half uh, microprocessor that has a, a USB interface that you can program with the, a computer. Um, it's got an input to change the modes on it to, to be able to, to initiate some of the data logging and some of the other features. Uh, there's a nice cheap little display you can get with 128 by 64 uh, character display, which works really nice. Um, See here, I'm trying to get this out of here. So you're measuring wind speed and the load on the line, the load cell. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yes. Um, it's got, uh, the, to, to measure, I'll get into that a little bit later, the way you measure the line tension, I've got a load cell, which is a, a couple of different strain gauges uh, that are put together with a little amplifier that hooks up to the microprocessor, and then kind of a homebrew wind turbine for measuring the the, uh, the line uh, or the, the wind speed. And then I'm working out, I inter integrate a, um, an inertial measurement unit. It's got some solid state gyros and, and accelerometers and things in it that can, you know, if we ever, if we ever wanted to increase the, the, uh, the, the parameters we wanted to get, that's gonna be pretty helpful. So um, kind of a picture of this then, it hangs on the line. Right now, this is downwind uh, quite a ways from, from the kite, but the ideal would, uh, would be to set it up as close as you can to the kite, and not too close because it starts oscillating. If you put too much weight, you know, as, as everybody probably aware of with, with hanging a camera too close to the, 
to the kite, but want to get this up as close as possible to the kite. Then it hangs down. Um, and then it's got uh, uh, the turbine kind of on a pendulum with the counter or the balance or the, the weight of the batteries to kind of keep it vertical. Um, and then um, kind of a neat little approach for, I think for, for measuring the, the line tension or some, some tension pulleys, which I'll get into in a little bit on that. Um, and then it's got the display on the top of it and then kind of a little front panel where you can get to the SD card and power switch. And then it's got a connector um, that you can plug into the wind sensor and you can add some other switches and sensors uh, if you want to. And then the mode control switch. Um, then the way it measures the line tension on it is if uh, it's a set of three pulleys that are um, set and you run the, the kite line through kind of in this fashion where it goes over the top and then down and then over. So when the line's un under tension to the kite, there's an upward force that pushes on uh, the way it's mounted, uh, the, the pulley is mounted um, to, the, to the load cell and that captures the, the weight or the, the tension that, that, um, that, that it puts on it. The nice thing about this is you can attach this to the line. You can actually hold it in your hand or, or attach it with another uh, ground uh, line. And then you can let the line out or bring it in or hold it static and it just continuously measures the line tension. So you don't have to take this thing off um, and it just gives you a continuous readout of the, of the line tension, uh, which is kind of a nice, nice, nice thing. I'll ultimately want to incorporate something like this into the reel that I have, where it's just got kind of a real time line tension sensor on it hooked right to the end of the reel. So you can kind of tell what, how it's pulling uh, all the time. Great. Um, and the, 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 the wind speed um, measurement then is just a, a 3D printed uh, wind turbine uh, into a little shield housing and then took a, a simple uh, optical sensor. It's a little LED and a, and a, a photodiode that uh, can, can uh, detect if there's a shiny spot next to it or, or a dark spot. And then uh, just uh, take the shaft of the, of the turbine and put a little uh, piece of reflective tape on it so that every time it rotates one revolution, it sends a discrete to this uh, the microprocessor. And then you can use that to, to determine the RPM. And then uh, you calibrate it, uh, hang it out the, the side of the car on a pole and drive along and, and keep, keep an eye out, you know, record the, 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 um, the, auto, the car uh, um, speedometer while you're data logging. And then you can correlate wind speed to RPM and then you can get a pretty accurate reading, you know, scale it so that it's, it, it, it captures uh, wind speed pretty accurately. Oh, that's um, great. And inside, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of, of uh, things, a uh, little, little uh, 3D printed chassis. And then these are all, a lot of them you can buy uh, just at DigiKey or some of the other um, um, uh, electronic houses. It's got the Arduino microprocessors buried under here with the USB port. Uh, and then the load cell is basically the same kind of load cell that you get for a bathroom scale. You can get them for about three bucks a piece. Um, yeah, Mike, just to let you know, it looks like what the screen you're sharing is just the uh, PowerPoint slide number five. Uh, and if you're using a second screen, we're not seeing that screen. Oh, but we, but we are tracking what you're saying. though. Okay, hang on here. What's up? Uh, PowerPoint screen five. Hang on. No, I'm saying we see slide number five. We see your mouse moving now whatever that's the screen we're, that you're sharing okay so let me if i go to full screen are you seeing that is a full screen uh i'll tell you in a minute i still see line tension measurement and i still see the powerpoint it's not a, it's not in slideshow mode it's just on okay. the machine, the individual slide which is fine we're okay so you, as long as you can see seven, this you yeah. can see the full, the full slide though, right? So I'll just go back to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Have you seen this one? Yeah, we haven't seen that one, but we, we just saw the slide five, uh, but we're now seeing the rest of them. Yeah. Okay. So there's slide five. Slide uh, six is the, the display. Yeah. The front panel. Um, okay. Yeah. You saw this already, right? Yeah. The only thing we saw before was slide five. Okay. Well, we okay. Speaking, but it looked like uh, you were speaking to some of the other slides. So I'm just telling you, uh, yeah, if you just click on that slide, okay. 
then we'll see it. Yeah. I'll go back. Okay, so that's the black diagram. And I'll make these available if anybody's interested in going back. Basic black diagram. I won't go through it again. The overall uh, layout of it, of uh, the different features, uh, the display in the front panel, um, the, uh, the, the line tension thing. I don't know if you saw that then. Yeah, that's a genius. Okay. Uh, this, and and uh, the wind turbine uh, yep. feature and then, uh, internals of it. So you've got the Arduino with a little load cell amplifier. Um, there's a, a, a data logger module you can pick up. Um, then there's the, the inertial reference unit that's in process of getting integrated right now. And then the display and all packs. And you can pick these up for five, 10 bucks a piece, some of these different modules and just build them up. And then it's just programmed in Arduino C, um, which which uh, is is not terrible difficult to, to use, but it, it's a nice, very modular building block kind of approach. You can put a lot of interesting things together with that. Um, uh, development system then is just uh, on a laptop with a USB port, and uh, you can play with it until you, know, you get all the parameters you need. It's got a nice uh, plotter and and data. Uh, um, uh, display feature, um, and then as far as as far as getting the information um, on it, I've, I've got some preliminary data. Tried to to compare a lot of the different uh, outputs, and I, I started with just a stock a, a stock crossbar for the levitation, and here it's just showing uh, flight time in seconds, so roughly ten minutes, a little over ten minutes of flight with on this side is the, the wind speed and the line tension. Um, the red line in this case is the line tension and the blue line is the uh, wind speed. And you can see, you know, as the wind is changing, the, the, the tension on the line is, is, is changing as well, which, which you would expect. This kind of forms kind of a basic baseline of, of what uh, a levitation in this, this particular day happened to, to provide. So, uh, pull anywhere from 12 to uh, 16, 17, 18 pounds um, of force on it. And then uh, took it down and, and changed out the, the crossbar and put a uh, kind of the standard uh, dynamic spreader, which kind of leaning toward more, because it's it's a, uh, um, expanding quite a bit. The design on the on the DS is, is expanding quite a bit. Um, thinking about more of more like an adaptive crossbar now, but with that DS approach, uh, you can see that uh, the, the wind speed um, is now higher than the the, uh, the the pole. So you can see that the, the changing from a stock crossbar to a DS, uh, you've got a little bit uh, less pull on the line, and it's a little little bit better regulated. Um, and then um, when you release the flex strap and just fly the the, the uh, spreader without a flex strap, you can see. Uh, you get quite a bit less um, pull on the line and a little bit better regulation. And this is what I think a lot of the guys that are running the R8 are flying if they don't use a, a flex strap. Uh, you lose quite a bit of lift uh, in general, uh, but you get a, a nicer response, um, softer response. And then um, there's another thing I'm working on, I'm still uh, developing it, but a thing called an adaptive bridle. Uh, an adaptive flex strap bridle that that uh, helps regulate things even more, and it pulls. It gets a little bit more of the of your uh, tension, especially at low low winds up, and then uh, but provides a little bit better regulation. So these are kind of the initial initial results. Um, pretty promising. The thing I found that was interesting is is uh, you get quite a bit of variation in the line pull, which I guess you'd expect depending on what angle the the kite is at if it's at a low angle or a high angle at a given wind speed. Low angle, higher wind speed, you're going to get more tension than you would at the same wind speed if your kite's at a higher angle. So um, I wanted to to add some some capability to measure the line angle as well and plot that, and just so I can I can get a little bit better uh, comparison of how the thing's working and better understand how the kite's working. Um, so that's what I've got. Um, like I said, for, for uh, next steps, working to in integrate the, the IMU and then working on some, some updates to the software to be able to, to uh, measure the line angle. Um, and I'll, I'll be working on that this spring. 
And then also there's quite a bit of in interesting information. Um, when you look at some of the data that comes out of it, depending on how you sort it, this is a sort of the, the data logger data um, where, where um, this shows uh, just in a linear, linear in time, what the wind speed and the tension are doing at a given time. But then if you sort the data a little bit differently and you just sort uh, the tension as a function of wind speed across the board, you'll see that, that at any given wind speed, for instance, at uh, 14 miles an hour, you have quite a bit of variation. And these, these are taken at different times of the flight, but you end up with quite a wide band of variation of line pull as a function of wind speed. Um, and you can do some, some, some uh, you know, uh, uh, linear uh, plotting and stuff to find kind of what the trend line is. But a lot of these variations I found are because of the different altitude and the different angle that the kite's at. Um, so going to try to work to come up with some algorithms to kind of assess that a little bit better to get a more objective view of, of, of how things are working. Um, so let's see. Uh, and if you could uh, move to wrap it up, Mike, we have to move yep. on a little quicker. That's it. So, so that's that's what I've got. Um, and potentially down the road, I don't know if there's an interest. You know, if if, if this does work out, you know, if we come up with kind of a standardized way of of uh, taking repeated measurements, you can build a few of these or in in kind of set out with different people to try to characterize different types of kites to kind of understand how they perform, just to get a more objective. Uh, way to categorize them and uh, and understand different design changes how they work, that and that's great. it. I'm definitely interested. I got all kinds of ideas. Good. <laughs> that we'll okay. have to pursue offline. But thank you very much. Any other questions for Mike yep. before we move on to Pierre? Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, Pierre, you're up. Okay. Yeah, I just uh, quickly wanted to go through uh, a few kite festivals that will happen uh, in hopefully uh, this year. Uh, I also would like to present my travel cap bag with five uh, kites and a few rigs, and also introduce a new French kite association called Cap Cerbelon. And Bernard Noël is also uh, one of the members of that uh, new association. So the different uh, festival, <clears throat> we start with a uh, with Berk. Uh, Berk will be unfortunately this year uh, on exactly the same dates as Cervia. Uh, I don't know for what reason uh, they decided to maintain those dates and not try to adapt to Cervia, uh, but obviously the uh, cappers or the kite flyers uh, will have to make a choice uh, between going to Berk or going to uh, Cervia and also Burke has a new uh, organization. It's not uh, Gérard Clément anymore. Cervia is happening from April 22nd to May 2nd. It's, it's a great kite festival. If you have a chance to go, uh, I really uh, encourage you to, to go. Uh, Capifano, uh, Wolfgang just talked about it and here's the uh, main beach where all the kite flyers uh, are bringing their kites. I'm not going to go back to what uh, Wolfgang said, but we'll be there from uh, June 10 to 27. Then Notre Dame de Mont, which is the only cap festival in the world, uh, uh, brings together about 15 cappers, mostly from France, in Notre Dame de Mont, which is uh, south of uh, Brittany. Uh, it's a small festival. It's really nice and interesting, very intimate. And if you have the chance, I never had the chance to go, and this year will be the 10th year. Uh, hopefully, I'll be, uh, I'll be there. Uh, and then later in August, but I don't, I could not find the dates, uh, maybe Wolfgang, if you have them, uh, and thank you for the picture, uh, there's the Festival of Leba in Poland, which might be uh, interesting, and also Dieppe uh, in September, which the last one was in uh, uh, 2018. Uh, so the dates are not known yet, but I, I just spoke on the phone this morning uh, with a hotel in Dieppe, and they supposed the dates would be uh, from September 10 to 18. Uh, so that's another rendezvous, and I hope that the pandemic will be behind us and that we'll be able to uh, meet uh, on the uh, grass in, uh, in Dieppe. 
if you want to have information to these festivals, you can uh, scan this uh, QR code. And um, I listed all the different, uh, um, all the different uh, websites of those uh, festivals uh, if you need them. Now, traveling with kites and cap gears, I've been traveling uh, for the past 40, 45 years. I've been traveling probably four or five months per year. Uh, and since I've been doing cap, I've been traveling with a cap bag. And um, traveling for professional reason, uh, I need to, to, I mean, to travel with a suit and ties. And so I had to downsize the, the size of my cap bag. And right now my cap bag is five kites, one heavy duty auto cap rig, two light auto rig, one GoPro rig, one Insta one uh, rig, one 360 panoramic rig. I also travel with three reels and a few other tools, but the objective is to be under 20 kilos. So that's, that's the bag, that's, uh, that's the uh, North Face uh, bag. That's a medium, uh, medium size. Uh, number two uh, is, and that's something really nice and interesting, that's a Canadian hat from Tidy, uh, and it has a lifetime warranty. So if it wears out, you send it back and they send you a new one. This is my second one. That's a great, uh, great hat. Uh, number three, uh, those are my, the, the kites I'm traveling with. Um, so on the, on the right, you have a cup for two square meter. Uh, the um, gray fragile cube is the uh, rocker from uh, Sando. Uh, the black tube is the R11. The gray tube is the R8 travel edition. Also have a stowaway delta for very, very, very strong wind. Uh, and also on the far left is a pendulum for my uh, for a panoramic uh, camera. And as you can see, the maximum length of the of those tubes uh, is uh, is uh, 60, 62 or 63 centimeters. It's about two feet, and that goes all that goes into the bag. Um, number four, those are my uh, lines. So I've got three different ones at three different strengths. Uh, number five is uh, a, a small tripod from my Insta that I also use. Uh, because uh, I put that on the line and it has no, uh, no footprint of the camera. Uh, and so it's very nice for uh, panorama. Uh, number six is my um, heavy duty rig that can be used uh, either horizontally or vertically. Number seven, uh, those are two small um, uh, vertical uh, um, uh, rigs. And all those rigs, I uh, use uh, the uh, DB65 uh, Rico battery uh, that, <clears throat> that allows me to only uh, travel with one charger, one charger for the battery of the camera, which is also the same battery that I'm using uh, on the rig. Uh, number eight, those are the different uh, tools I use. Uh, the uh, figure eight carabiners, uh, the crocodile grip, the uh, reels, uh, everything that I need. Uh, number nine is uh, a few tools, uh, Ziplocs and so on. Number 10, uh, some uh, more tools and uh, a wind meter. Uh, 11 is a raincoat. Uh, 12 are different uh, cords and, um, uh, and Velcro. Number 13 is the, um, my box for the GoPro Hero 3. Uh, the <coughs> yellow rig is a picave. Uh, thanks, Morgan. Uh, and that picave was made with some small part of an umbrella. And this um, this part, uh, this one is the uh, the rig for the Insta. I mean, the uh, the white stuff doesn't belong to the rig. Uh, those. This is for the um, different uh, electric things. One thing is missing is the charger for the um, for the video. Uh, and then I also carry a small back, 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 back sack uh, because uh, if I need to go to, uh, uh, I'm not traveling with all of that uh, from the hotel or from my uh, Airbnb, so I can just downsize the, um, what I have, uh, the gloves. Uh, and on the, on the left, I have the video downturn, and those are the equipment for the uh, Insta uh, 1R. Uh, one inch uh, sensor. Uh, thanks, Wolfgang, for this uh, very interesting uh, equipment. And that's that's the bag once it's full. Uh, it's 
very full. It's very compact, uh, but it works well. Uh, so if you, if, again, if you'd like to have more information and where to find the different, uh, different pieces I just introduced to you, you can scan that uh, QR code and you'll get uh, a link to all the different URLs that you might be interested in. And now I would like to introduce to you a new um, kite association, which is called Cap Servolon. Uh, and Cap Servolon wants to promote kites, wind gardens, boomerangs, uh, wind decorative and playful creation, everything that is related to wind. Cap Servolon wants to highlight and preserve the kite heritage of our ancestors. And this also concerns everything that is created today. And Cap Servolon is also a new magazine in the world of kite flying published four times a year. It is published in French and it is the members platform and forum. Uh, so the, the, the association was launched in January uh, last year. Uh, and those are the few uh, magazines that have been, uh, that have been published. Uh, and the last magazine uh, was published in January. If you want to have a copy of this magazine, uh, it's a 20, uh, I think it's a 28 pages. Uh, please scan that uh, QR code and you have access directly to the, um, to the magazine uh, and you can flip through it. And um, I really encourage you, uh, if you are interested, uh, to also scan this QR code uh, that leads you to um, the uh, membership page of the uh, Cap Servolon. Uh, I think the Cap Servolon uh, will be attending Dieppe yep, with, with, with its uh, own uh, tent. Uh, and, and that will be uh, one way to, to get a better uh, recognition uh, outside. That's it for me. I tried to make it short. Um, if you want to keep a copy of this presentation, uh, scan this uh, QR code again, and you'll have everything on your, on your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Very uh, compact, and uh, it's amazing the stuff that you travel with uh, and how compact you get it. So uh, congratulations on that. All right, any questions for Pierre? And keep those cat, keep those kite festivals in mind. And if Pierre, if you could stop scanning, stop sharing, uh, and then I'm going to share next just a couple quick things on a real simple cap rig. And then after me, just give a heads up to everyone else. Uh, Aeronaut will um, speak next, uh, and then Sue, and then Cap Jasso. So we get uh, four more presentations. I know we're over by a little bit, and if everyone's comfortable, keep going. We'll keep going. If you have to leave, just go ahead and leave. Um, but let's charge ahead. So I'm going to try and then you guys can uh, take a look uh, offline. So basically, I was going to present just a little bit about the GoPro Hero 10 camera. And I think you guys can see my face. So this is just the uh, GoPro on a string. So very simple uh, rig. Um, but there's been a lot of advancements made with these most recent GoPros. Uh, as some of you know, I use these a lot for kayak sailing, which I've now combined with uh, the cap. Um, and so the results were quite surprising. I've been trying to use it for both stills and for video. Uh, and I've used the GoPro on both a, a simple string, like I've just shown you here, as well as put it on the auto cap rig itself. Uh, and I've <clears throat> published two uh, YouTube videos that kind of show uh, what I was going to present is just a couple short video clips of the output from the GoPro. Um, but my screen share is not working today. Uh, so I, I would ask you just to go to uh, the Go my uh, YouTube area where you'll find, and I'll put uh, links to these in the chat so you can find them. Um, but it's, it's quite amazing. The short answer is uh, the stability with just standard 4K 60 video uh, with uh, with the stability, standard stability, not the super stability, but just the standard stability uh, uh, enabled, uh, the camera is very, very, the video is just rock steady um, and very usable from a, a kite aerial photography uh, perspective. And I'll share just the bottom of the, uh, I got to stop. I got to get rid of my background in a second. Uh, Background. All right, if you can get back to this. So anyway, this is the GoPro camera. I think all you guys are familiar with it. 
Uh, and there's been an adaption that you can do on the bottom. Uh, the, the most recent GoPros have these two little feet that fold out. You can probably see that at an angle. And there's been a, a third party uh, substitute for this that you can take these off. And when you fold it flat, there's actually a standard tripod mount now at the bottom. You can see that angle right there. So you can attach it right to your AutoCap rig. And then I use it um, both to have a safety line attached to the camera and also give it an angle so it points back towards the ground. But the video results are, are quite uh, spectacular uh, as far as, you know, uh, without a gimbal, without a, any other stabilization, just internal stabilization to the camera is quite impressive. Also, the Wi-Fi uh, is quite impressive on the camera. I'm able to control the camera from my phone out to almost 300 feet. Uh, and you can go in and see a preview of what you're shooting, you can go in and change it from video to uh, time lapse, change all the exposure settings. Um, so anyway, for me, which is I normally just shoot plain auto cap, it's kind of startling to be able to see what you're actually shooting, <laughs> but uh, right on your phone. So it's very simple. Uh, and for me that I've had a habit of dunking my very expensive Sony into salt water and totally ruining them, uh, this waterproof camera is a, uh, an insurance policy for me. So that's my quick uh, presentation. Well, we're enjoying some kite flying today. It's Jim Powers. we are got my puppy here keeping me company. And we're testing out some uh, kite aerial photography uh, variations here. We got a big uh, eight foot Rukaku tied off to 150 pound Dynama line right here. Let's see if I could zoom in. There we go. Anyway, it's got a large head knot tied to some 150-pound uh, Dynama line. And then further out, we got a whole bunch of line laundry out on the kite line today. And way at the top, we got a blue kite team, eight and a half foot uh, Rukuku kite that is uh, flying in about 10, 10 mile an hour wind, maybe a gust of 12. Uh, overall, pretty a nice day to fly kite. We have it up fairly high, trying to reach some steadier winds. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of line laundry. These are uh, 20 meter tube tail and a couple of 15 meter uh, tails. All right next to that yellow streamer, you'll see a, uh, a GoPro hanging on a string. So that's the cap uh, that we're doing today. It's just a simple GoPro hanging on a string, spinning freely. Uh, we're testing out the video stabilization mode and also uh, time-lapse uh, still shots. So that's what's up there. And then there's a bunch more line laundry below it. And it's a little hard to tell. But if I zoom back out to normal, uh, you can see those kites. The kite's up there pretty high. Um, over the Wind Watcher Proving Ground. So uh, we're testing this out. We'll hope to share some of this as part of the Cappy Zoom. Uh, that'll be uh, this coming weekend on January the 29th. All right, bye. All right, this little bit of close-up of the GoPro and the string. Again, it's just a piece of string attached to a Brooks hang-up on the kite line. Kite's further up the line. And just uh, about three or four feet hanging straight down. And I have a little modification on this GoPro. It has a place to actually screw in a tripod mount screw. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see here, but when it rotates around, you'll see that it, if I get my uh, hand on this, it actually hangs down at a slight angle towards the ground, uh, just because the string is offset from the center axis of the um, tripod mount. So the center of gravity makes it tilt down a little bit. Uh, and that gives you a, a little picture of that hanging there. And right now it's taking 4K video, uh, 4K 60, and I was able to control it up to about two to 300 feet off the ground with my camera, uh, excuse me, my cell phone, uh, using a GoPro app. And I was able to change it from uh, different video modes uh, to uh, time-lapse mode. I do have stabilization on. Uh, we'll see what it looks like here in a little bit when we take a look at the video. Enjoy. As part of the cap testing, I was also testing out the crocodile line grips. 
Uh, and these photos here just kind of show the setup with the kite with a blue kite team, Rukuku at the top, and a whole bunch of line laundry underneath uh, the kite. And the actual globe pole is just uh, hung on a string, as you see here, just next to the yellow ribbon. Uh, and those tails you near know, the top of the kite are quite long. They're over 20 meters in length. So that gives you an idea of where we are. And now we're back in GoPro into the sky. Enjoy. We're trying to show the uh, GoPro Hero 10 Black using it in time lapse mode for kite aerial photography on a very cold day over the Wind Watcher Proving Grounds. I probably can barely make it out there, but there's a GoPro suspended on a simple string from the kite line, and the wind is just pushing it around uh, to give it different angles. And it's taking a picture every 10 seconds right now. And a little bit earlier, it was doing 4K video. And I can control it from the phone because uh, the camera is within the Wi Fi range of the phone, which is several hundred feet, which is more than adequate for uh, the kite aerial photography. So far, so good. And next up are some still photos taken from the GoPro uh, Hero 10 Black, uh, just a series of stills uh, that were taken. Uh, GoPro allows you to shoot with JPEG and RAW files, so you get basically two files for each shot. And these are the RAW files that have been edited in Adobe Lightroom uh, just to, uh, you know, publish them. Uh, so that's uh, some examples that you can see here. Um, Things I would also add here is that we were able to control the GoPro from the ground uh, just by using the Wi-Fi on my camera in the GoPro to the Wi-Fi on my phone. And I was able to get a good two to 300 feet in range. So I was able to switch it between um, the 4K video and then switch over to time-lapse mode. You can get the preview. Uh, pretty much control the GoPro and all the settings, you know, from the ground. Um, there were a couple times when I got beyond 300 feet uh, in distance uh, where I did lose connection, uh, but I'd say 300 feet on end, it was pretty steady. Um, so that was a, a good outcome uh, and gives you some flexibility and be able to change the uh, photo settings and exposure uh, again, this is just a GoPro on a string, so there's no control over the direction, the pan, or the tilt. That's all driven by the wind. 
uh, and but you can't control the uh, the camera mode and the exposure settings all right we'll go back to some of the video here in just a second enjoy share and uh, apologize for not being able to uh, provide the actual video, but I'll put a, a link in the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn my time over to the next person. And I'm not uh, sure. Jim, yep. I just had one question. You mentioned that you have a 300 feet range with your Wi-Fi. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's very impressive with the, uh, uh, I have a Samsung uh, S21 Ultra cell phone and then the GoPro Hero 10 Black, uh, and it's easily two to 300 feet. I did lose connection a few times when I went out to 400 feet or 500 feet, but when I came back down into the, that two to 300 foot range, it reconnected, so. Good to know. Yep. Um, all right, so next up on the presentation tour here would be Aeronaut. Oh, well. And it looks like I see your screen is starting to share and, and we can see it. So go ahead. I got a couple of my grandkids here. <laughs> uh, and the well hear your voice, but we can see your screen. Can you hear me still, Mike? Okay. My, I've only been doing this for about um, an, uh, less than a year. And my interest in kite started um, when I was about 10. And uh, my father was in the RAF. And one day um, he turned up with, um, how can I this now? one day my father uh, presented me, age 10, with this bright yellow tube. And uh, this uh, inside the tube was a kite. And the kite dates from 1943. They still had a stock of these kites in the stores. And um, the history of it is it's a Gibson girl kite, uh, as I say, dating from uh, 1943. And uh, all of the uh, RAF air crew were provided with these kites. And if the aircraft crashed in the sea, they were able to use it to lift a radio aerial and um, uh, signal distress. So my father not only gave me this uh, kite, but he went back into stores and he came out with one mile, yes, one mile of line and uh, on a spool. And I've actually had the kite flying um, with one mile of line out, wow. which, is, which is a bit naughty because I was actually flying from an active air base at the time. <laughs> and all aircraft were actually grounded uh, for a while 
uh, while they found this small boy at the end of this line. Uh, it was very naughty, but there we are. Um, and there I was, age 10, and I suppose I had the first, um, my first experiments with what you now call line laundry, because um, uh, there's the Gibson girl assembled, by the way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very good because it has all these instructions showing how to put it together. And on the other side, there are two tether points um, for the crew to decide where to attach the line according to wind speed. And the engineering quality is absolutely amazing. Um, they made 11,000 of these uh, in, in America, and they were shipped over to the UK. Um, 11,000, and the quality of the, the pressings and the soldering and the swaging and the forging is absolutely remarkable. So this is the first part of my retro cap uh, theme. Uh, later on, we shall return to some more retro. But for, first of all, I'd just like to talk about some of the line laundry items which I created as a small boy in short trousers. Um, the first one was my bumblebee, uh, my, my bumblebee space capsule. I was fascinated by space and I wanted to be the first British person into space. Or at least I wanted to launch the first bumblebee into space. <laughs> so, here, so here we have a toilet roll in her, and um, you can see the various labels. And it's attached to a, a, a curtain ring on the kite line, and then a, a, a parachute made from a handkerchief. And it blew all the way up the line with a bumblebee inside. And in, inside the capsule, I put a blob of honey and some hay for the bumble naught to sit on. And after a while, I bought the, brought the, uh, the, the space capsule down. And I discovered that the bumblebee had bailed out. <laughs> it had obviously survived, bailed out, and gone back to the hive. So that was uh, my first mission into space. And then the other device I made, which um, you might still like to play with yourself. We've talked about um, instrumentation. Mike was talking about various widgets. He's, he's on his, his kite. I, I'm also fascinated by uh, developing um, devices. And that's one of the wonderful things about this hobby is that Unlike drones, where you buy it and you fly it, you learn nothing. Um, Kappa provides plenty of opportunities for innovation, um, invention, making stuff, failing and rebuilding. So this is my first invention. Um, it's a peak altitude uh, recorder. Uh, the, the big tube at the top, the long tube at the top, is just an air vessel. And out of the air vessel is a narrow bore plastic tube that goes down into an old film canister full of water. So as the kite ascends, the air in the upper canister expands, bubbles out into the water, and then as it descends, water is draw drawn back up the tube to a level that records the peak altitude attained by the kite. <laughs> wow. Of course, air, air temperature is also a factor, but I'd like to, I'd like to convince you that altitude change, um, certainly if the altitude is, change is large enough, and what you really are recording is some measure of peak altitude. Why not build one now? It just it costs nothing. But you still have to eat all the vitamin C tablets inside the tube. OK, um, a few years ago, uh, I was introduced to uh, 3D printing by a, a friend of mine down the road. And at the time, I thought, I don't want to build plastic dinosaurs. I don't want to build plastic war games figures. And how many plastic doorknobs do I want to make? But then I went to an exhibition um, by GoPrint 3D in, in Yorkshire, and they have a whole range of 3D printing machines. And they convinced me that uh, there are two main technologies that are worth considering if you wanted to go into 3D printing. One was SLA, stereolithography, which builds the solid part from a resin, a tank of resin, which I guess you'll, you'll all know about. That technology is still evolving and it's still expensive, whereas fused filament deposition has reached a peak of what it can achieve in terms of materials and precision and stability. So I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll dive in. And um, I bought, I decided that I didn't want to build the machine. I wanted to use the machine to make something rather who would want to build their own laser printer or mm -hmm. build their own water inkjet printer. You want to buy the machine that does the job. So I bought, um, um, an Ultimator 3, which is made in the Netherlands, and it's, a, and it's an industrial machine, extremely robust, extremely stable, and I can't fault it. I've had very, very few failed prints. It's, it was a bit more expensive than a Prusa, but I, it works. And the first thing I made 
um, was a modern aeroplane because back in the day I was an aero modeler. Um, it's all made of um, tough PLA, Ultimaker's tough PLA, apart from the black uh, rods you can see, which are carbon fiber spars and longer rods. That was my first attempt and it's radio controlled uh, without the electronics in at the moment. The only problem is it is a bit too heavy. It has to fly at about Mach 3 before it'll leave the ground. But, and um, I can't run that fast, um, but perhaps, perhaps uh, when I'm a bit older, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to do that. So that's my first. I've built another airplane since then. Um, we, we'll, we can talk about that another time. Um, once I was into 3D printing, I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is really good fun. Um, and um, my poor Gibson girl was getting a bit frayed and tattered. And it, now, it's, um, now it's 80 years old. I thought that perhaps I shouldn't be flying this valuable antique and I'd make a replica. This is my Gibson boy on the right hand side. It's a bit large, it's a meter as opposed to three feet. And all of the parts which are forged or pressed in the um, Gibson girl are 3D printed in the Gibson boy. So at the top, you'll see these amazing parts which um, were made by the Bendix Corporation inside the Gibson, Gibson girl. You've got the the, 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 uh, the spider in the center, top and bottom, uh, the way that the, uh, the sail is attached um, to the spars. And then this is one of their hinges, custom made parties, all custom made engineering, astonishing quality of engineering. And underneath the Gibson Boy equivalents, here's a, the spider, um, 3D printed in carbon fiber, top and bottom. And then the sail is attached by my own idea for these, um, uh, the equivalent of the ones at the top, and then the hinges are uh, 3D printed. So um, three, the, the Cura is the slicing program for the Ultimaker. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's foolproof, it guides you all the way, provides lots of different settings, love it to bits. Can you still see my internet step connection is unstable? Can you see it? Yeah, we can, can still see, see it and we can hear you. Oh, okay. okay, fine. I mean, I'm living in a, in a little village on a tiny tectonic plate in the middle of the RSC, and we still, we've got electricity now and running water. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> these are the, uh, the, the, the spiders. Now the Ultimator, in fact, most um, desktop 3D printers can only print in a variety of um, plastics, but I designed these and had them made by uh, GoPrint 3D in um, carbon fiber. In fact, it's uh, chopped carbon fiber in nylon, extremely stiff and stable. And I, I wanted those uh, to be as strong as possible for this spider, which takes a lot of, a lot of load. Now I'm into 3D printing. It's, it's, it's taken over my life. I, I'm making things for my wife's, wife's doll's houses, which is part of the domestic bargaining, I suppose you have to indulge in. Um, but um, I started, once I got into kite flying, replacing the Gibson girl, I thought I really would need to make myself a decent flying reel. Um, I think I put this on the forum and it's, it's on my website, but um, it started life as an electric fencing reel. You go to any farming shop and they have electric fence reels in all sizes and I've adapted it. There's a line feed here, 3D printed parts front and back, a uh, handle, and then there's a braking system which is 3D printed. And the whole thing's been strengthened with um, carbon fiber and resin poured in. And then there's the suspension, which I mentioned in my first posting um, on the forum. I, I, I was aware of the Picovet, but I thought, well, this, the Picovet's 90 years old. The idea is 90 years old. And now we have carbon fiber 3D printing. Uh, let's think out of the box. And um, the suspension, uh, the idea is that it maintains the camera um, or whatever you attach to here uh, at exactly uh, horizontal or exactly the same angle relative to the kite line. So as this pivots left and right at the bottom, um, it remains parallel and maintains a fixed angle with respect to the kite line. Um, and it, I've designed it so that um, at the top, can you see my mouse cursor? Yes. At the yeah. top, um, yeah. there's a, a tapered triangular socket, which is inspired by the engineer's Morse taper socket. And you have in lathes. Um, you can, it's, I got the angle so that if you have an equivalent male object, it jams in there and you mm -hmm. can attach all sorts of objects. So the, one of the things I'm attaching, um, I don't know if you can see on my camera, um, this is altimeter. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a barometric altimeter. There's a, a, a static port here and a data logger inside. And I'm recording um, air pressure uh, at 10 hertz. And I can plot altitude with that. And then on the bottom, 
This adapter I use for uh, dangling various camera modules, which you'll, which you'll see um, in a second. So the first thing I, 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 I've designed and made is um, a panning gimbal unit. I call it a pan gimbal. So on the right hand side here we have the um, the part which uh, attaches to the adapter I've just mentioned and that goes around at a rate that is determined by the electronics on a stepper motor inside of here and then under, underneath the battery pack and the gimbal controller so just looking inside um, the unit the, the actual pan gimbal part we have um, a stepper motor which has been salvaged from a printer stepper motor driver and then a pulse generator uh, here's a, a switch which enables you to pan clockwise or anti-clockwise and then a potentiometer that allows you to pan from anything from one revolution in 10 minutes to one revolution in 30 seconds. I usually have it at every, every two minutes. Um, the whole, um, the whole uh, caboodle is um, designed um, in 3D um, and the other thing that I use, for 2D I use FastCAD which is bulletproof it seems. I've been using that for 20 years. And now, I'm, but for 3D engineering, 3D design, I use a Libre design. And um, it's using 3D is about uh, three or four times harder than doing 2D. But once you're there, it's fun, of course, it's fantastic. Um, you can visualize everything, you can move it around, you can check for interference, you can check the aesthetics, and the chance of failure is much less than if you're making things from scrap. And um, the other thing which suddenly occurs to me when you have 3D printing and when you have 3D modeling like this, it changes your whole mindset. If you, if you like me, have a conventional workshop, I've got a lathe and a milling machine, but when you go in there, you think, what can I make by subtractive machining? But when you have 3D printing and this technology, you think, what would I like to make? Because the possibilities are almost limitless in terms of shape uh, and where you position the strength and so on. So, what would I like to make? Well, let's get on to the cameras. People have talked about their cameras. In that Pan Gimbal unit, I'm using a Runcam 5 uh, camera, uh, which is a 4K wide angle um, GoPro equivalent. And then I've just um, been given uh, this little Sony camera, um, which is an 8 um, megapixel uh, zoom camera, um, on which um, I've made another 3D printed. Uh, mount which goes again on the bottom of my suspension and that's been modeled um, in 3D and the, the modeling is such and your confidence is such that it worked first time. Inside the back which I've made transparent there's a 9 volt battery, one of uh, Gentle's uh, trigger units and then the um, a servo which operates a finger that sets the shutter. The other the two red bits are just to protect, protect it in case the, the system has a crash. Um, now on to the other part of my retro cap. This is the cap part of the retro. Um, deep in one of the, one of the boxes uh, 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 in the, under the eaves, I discovered a camera um, under, in amongst the dinosaur bones and the coal <laughs> measures. It was made in 1988 in Taiwan. And um, it was very advanced for its time. It automatically loads the film, it winds the film, it auto-focused, auto-exposure. And the interesting thing is, it has an intervalometer on it. You can set the mode that it takes a picture, one picture every minute. According to the instructions, this is so that you can record the growth of plants. Now, maybe things grow very, very quickly in Taiwan. In 36 minutes, uh, you can actually see, notice some growth in a plant. It must be something to do. It must be something to do with the climate that they have, but thankfully our garden doesn't grow that quickly. So uh, the little um, Rico camera, which I've only just um, unearthed, has been, I've made another mount for that one, and uh, it dangles on the bottom of, my, the, bottom of, the, of the suspension. And um, I've been using that. I've only been out once in the aeronaut testing grounds, and I've taken a couple of pictures it does suffer from big netting, in other words, limb darkening, but that can be corrected um, in all sorts of softwares. Um, and that's film or digital? There's film. It uses this sort of plastic celluloid stuff. Do you remember? You remember yeah. your grandfather? Yeah. Your grandfather had this stuff. And when you expose it to light, it does all. Anyway, you have to send it away. And one of the exciting <laughs> things is you have to wait. You have to it wait for the results. Like a week. Yeah. You have to wait. There's this sense of excitement. 
and I sent it away and they and, and I asked for it to be digitized at low resolution I get a CD back as well as the <laughs> negatives uh, so that's that's where I am with this at the moment and what comes next is um, I'm building um, uh, I'm building another piece of electronics which will record GPS uh, altitude airspeed temperature and um, yeah, barometric altitude and GPS coordinates, and that'll go on the adapter on the top of my suspension. So like, um, like we've seen from the other contributors, we'll be able to record all sorts of data because the Civil Aviation Authority have given me permission, uh, foolishly, to fly um, above the legal limit, <laughs> well above the legal limit, uh, provided I say, that. and I'd like to record some meteorological, scientific, or whatever data. So that's, that's, that's my presentation. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Well, the fun of using an iPhone is that the iPhone already does part of it in the EXIF file. It yep. gives you the GPS data, the temperature, and the altitude. The only thing that I've been noticing is that the altitude is not very accurate because it's in the wrong, uh, it's a ZX instead of X or I. So I yeah. use a barometric uh, a pressure sensor to see how well my iPhone is detecting the altitude. <laughs> And I can really notice up to 30 meter difference. Yes, my, the, uh, the GPS module that I'm using, like most GPS, it's, um, it's accurate in X and Y, but not in Z. So not in Z. The, the, unit, yeah. the, unit I'm, the unit I'm using is accurate to, uh, the, the resolution rather is two and a half meters in X and Y, and about um, five or six, five to 10 meters in Z. But I, well, 10 I, 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 to 30. I, yeah, but so I'll use, the, I'll use the barometric altimeter for true altitude and then X and Y just to find out where we are, yeah. Yeah, I like the electric reel winder, uh, and I like to combine it with Mike's load sensor. So when I have my kite up in the air over the wind watcher proving grounds, hmm. and as usual, I'm not holding the line and the wind stops, it could sense that and say to the winder, start winding. Oh, <laughs> very good, very well, good. marvelous. Jim, to be honest, what you have to learn is that <laughs> if you're a real kite lover, you don't leave your kite flying alone. You always stay with it like a pair of swans. They never yeah. part from their partner. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank I you don't love much. them enough, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, excellent presentation and a lot of great ideas there. Um, all right. If everyone, how's everyone's stamina? You ready to push on here? We have, I don't know, I think Sue might have dropped off. The Sue oh. is. Still with oh, she's still there. Okay, Sue, you're up now. <laughs> All right. And, and the Cap Jassa will be next. And that's the last one. And then we'll open it up for any latecomers. So, Sue, it's all you. Oh, one minute. And just while Sue is bringing that up, we are, uh, as we said at the beginning of this uh, session, we are recording it. So, everyone, I will be putting this up on YouTube in a couple of days, so. Very my screen, there you go. Share. Yeah. Okay. We can see your screen and we can hear you, so you're all set. Yeah, good. Um, um, Last May, I asked Bill Blake if he would uh, make me a rig like the one he had with the um, with that uh, handset. And now we go back. And um, so he said, uh, yes, he would do. And we um, talked about various things. And uh, but I didn't get it till uh, after after Christmas. Uh, because uh, the parts required um, were not available because of the pandemic. The, um, the holder, it, it got this part of the rig fairly well done, apart from one or two little bits. Uh, it had it working with this controller quite a long time ago. And um, uh, and then... Um, it, 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 and then they, it, it eventually got the parts and eventually made it and um, it came up to York and um, we had a little um, 
uh, session <laughs> pub, <laughs> and he was showing me how it works. And uh, and it it, uh, it works okay. Um, the handset there, it, the little um, wind. Um, yeah, and Sue uh, always sees your title slide, so you might want to advance it to uh, slide number two. I thought I had. Where is it? You are screen sharing. And we're seeing the the PowerPoint uh, screen, but not the not the screen. Not the I, slide. I think Slides. I think if you switch to full, if you switch to full screen after you've selected what to share, it'll stay on the original one, and and people won't see the full screen. So I think you have to go to full screen first, and then share that. Yeah, it depends. Or on or just that. keep doing what you're doing now. Yeah, just click on slide number two. We can see it. Um, I can't find that. All right, you might want to end your slideshow. I use it one screen or two. All right, then just reshare. Share screen. That one. Yeah. All right, we see your title slide. Move yep. your mouse. Move your mouse. All yeah. Right, we can see your mouse move. So click on slide two. Left. There you go. Click on that, and can now we can, slide? yeah, it's right. a little small, but we could see it. You might want to zoom in a little bit on the lower right, that plus sign, there we go. All right, oh, good, it's a little big, a little big. All right, good enough, we could see it. Yeah, we've flown it twice, but, um, the, the wind wasn't playing Bonnie. It was um, very, very gusty and strong when we first flew it. And, uh, but we got some pictures. And then, uh, yeah, that's the on-off switch, the aerial battery, and that's the receiver that um, receives the signal from the handset. Um, that's something else, controller. Not a clue what it is. And Sue, so if you could uh, zoom out a little bit, yeah. a little bit too zoomed in, like a hundred percent. No, we can see that's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the the shutter button, and when you first switch on, there's some aberration in something or other. You have to to re uh, connect each time. So you press that one and hold it after you've switched the rig on, and switch it on when there's um, a light on that yellow, on this yellow one that stops blinking when it's connected. And then at the top there, there's a nice big switch for um, manual, and you turn it on when it's manual, and switch it left and it goes auto. This little screen is actually um, a watch size. It comes with a watch strap. And um, uh, and that works quite well. Um, and I've got a bigger one, a big one like uh, three by four inch screen. And that's um, useful for more uh, detailed. The slider here, uh, that's, that's a, Okay, and then that side is the pan, left, right pan. It's a rocker switch. That works all right. And that's um, all the rig, all together. There's, uh, these are legs, spare batteries, the uh, LiPo batteries in a safety case, camera bag. That's the bigger screen they have. And that's the little controller the rig it's all upside down for some reason and um, that's the, the next strap for the controller and it all goes in the bag there i bought this bag at a car boot sale for three pound it's uh, excellent rig along there all by itself 
uh, camera battery there. This is the pick of air lines. I stick them in there to keep them out of the way. And the controller and the the bigger screen there, and that's the LiPo batteries in it. Mom, what else do I have? Oh, yes. That's Ken, my, uh, the other day. That's the, the controller. It's the first size, and uh, the big hanging up on the kite line. And this is one of the pictures it took. <laughs> <laughs> I had the I had the line over, over my arm so that um, I could take pictures of it. And the the kite was the Yorkshire flow form. It's very strong wind, and the rig was bouncing around. But this was a one from. Um, it's our usual flying field, and uh, that that was from the other day, uh, the first outing, and um, it's a big field, and we usually do our stunt kite flying there. So, um, and that's it. Um, unless you'd like a little uh, video, oh, where's my video gone? I'll just turn that one down. Right, well, you're going to try and show a video, Sue, or you're done? Um, no, I'm done. That's it. That's okay. it. Very good. Any questions for Sue? Some good work there. Good to <laughs> see you got that kite up in the air still. Um, all right, Cap Jessa is the last one that was on our agenda. So uh, our friend from Ljubljana, if you could uh, share your screen and we'll turn it over to you. And then while you're setting that up, um, what we'll do to wrap up the meeting, yeah, we'll open I'm it the up last for, one. So, yeah, I think you're the I think it, you might yeah. leave it open for anyone else that wants to say or present something briefly. Uh, we'll also shout out about any upcoming kite festivals, uh, and also we'll point up the uh, Flickr, uh, Cappy Zoom uh, group just to show a few photos there. Yeah. And that's it. So, that's what's up. We can see your screen, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Sasha. Um, I have severe stage fright, so I'll be reading this if you don't mind. Um, I'm a member of ah, here. I'm a member of Kapiasa Kite Team Slovenia. We are the oldest, uh, the largest, the best, and of course the only kite club in Slovenia. We started with kite with Kaita Aerial Photography in 2007. Um, that's why we have CAP in the name. Now we have expanded into other kite areas. We design and make kites. We do kite workshops. We launched a kite social awareness initiative called Strings of Hope. And we will organize a kite festival in Slovenia in late May. And you are, of course, all cordially invited. Um, I would like to start with the question that was written on the, on the poster for this event. Namely, is there a future for kites and kite aerial photography in the time of drones? The answer is, of course, a resounding yes. But there are more reasons than just our passion and nostalgia. Because kite is actually a truly amazing aerial scientific platform compared to other aerial solutions. We know that planes and helicopters are way too expensive to operate. We know that drones are annoying and kites are not. People hate drones but love kites. A kite can lift a lot and it can stay in the air for a long time. So when the conditions are right, a kite is simply unmatched. Um, a drone that do come close in performance um, costs about as much as a mid-range car. And of course, there's so much more that you can do with a kite, apart from beautiful pictures from above, um, because a large kite can easily lift a kilo or a couple of kilos of, of scientific equipment and it can stay in the air for hours 
So a kite can be used for all kinds of detecting, measuring, monitoring from air pollution, water pollution to wildlife observation and ecosystem monitoring, etc. And of course, you can be used for the thing that attracts us the most. This is aerial archaeology, especially things like this. This is a prehistoric site uh, settlement in, in, in France. These crop marks that can be seen only from the air and that suddenly appear in times of severe drought. This is something we always wanted to, to um, discover. So we were flying our kite over many known and potential archaeology sites in Slovenia. We shot many pictures, we posted them online. And this work caught the eye of Dr. John Wells from Scotland. Um, I think he's also a member of, of this forum. And he's a retired radiologist and is now a keen kite aerial archaeologist. And he specializes in multispectral imaging using ultraviolet and especially infrared cameras. And he called us and he said, yes, this, what you do is cool, but you need a infrared camera because it can reveal so much more than what can be seen with the naked eye. And we said, sure, Dr. Wells, but where can we get an infrared camera? And he said, no problem, I have a spare one here, I'll mail it to you. And he did. He sent us this, this is a Pentax uh, WG10 compact camera, um, but it is modified to detect infrared light. Um, the infrared block filter that is um, in front of uh, the sensor has been removed. And suddenly this thing is not an old compact camera, but uh, a rather powerful multispectral imaging device. The point of all these infrared and multispectral things is about the vegetation health, the health of the plants. The amount of reflected parts of the spectrum depends on uh, plant health. And this difference in reflectance of various parts of the spectrum, various wavelengths, can be used to determine how healthy plants are. And this is done by calculating the so-called NDVI index. This, it means normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI. I won't bother you with, with the details. It doesn't really matter. But this index is used mainly in, in see these are the differences in, in healthy plants reflects more near infrared light. The struggling plant reflects less and the dead plant reflects all wavelengths um, the same amount. This is an example of a NDVI map of a field. We can instantly recognize where um, the crops are doing okay, the, the red um, areas. Um, and we can see when the crops have problems. Um, so if a farmer checks such a map, he can see where exactly where he needs to put more fertilizer or where he needs to water the crops. Um, and he doesn't need to spread the fertilizer across all the field and is, is therefore um, saving both time and money. But this infrared magic is, is um, also useful in archaeology, in discovering buried um, structures that are um, invisible. Namely, imagine a, a, a buried ditch, and say a defensive ditch, and a buried wall. Plants that, that grow above the ditch um, have more soil, the water stays there longer, and they um, thrive. While Plants that, that um, grow above the buried wall, there is less soil, the water runs off faster, and they struggle. And these subtle differences in plant health can be detected by a multispectral infrared camera. And by calculating the NDVI, you can do a map of archaeological sites 
where buried ditches are, as before, more red and yellow, and buried walls are um, blue and green. So armed with this new infrared camera and uh, Rokaku kite, we went to a village named Kashe. This is east of Indiana, where we live, um, to the church of St. Andrew. You can see the church there. Um, this field in front of the church is um, designated as a potential archaeological site. The archaeologists know that something is here because they found pottery shards and roof tiles and a couple of tombstones. One is uh, on the wall of the church. Um, but no surveys have been done, no excavations. So while they know that something is here, they don't know what exactly is or where exactly it is. So we thought that this, this site would be a perfect um, test for our kite aerial multispectral technology. So we gave the kite to Victor. He's a 10 year old son of one of us. He loves to fly kites. He loves to, he loves to do kite aerial photography. And he was really proud that he can be a pilot of a infrared camera. And he started to walk across the field. The whole site is about 500 by 300 meters. And we needed to shoot the whole site twice, uh, once in infrared mode and once in multispectral mode. It was a hot day and we stayed there in the, in the shade, um, drinking beer while the kid toiled under the sun. Child labor, that's not allowed in Europe. This... <laughs> yeah. Very effective. Yeah, this is a, a multispectral, one of the multispectral images he took. This is, uh, this is a meadow and the field of, of grain. Uh, the colors are unnatural because the infrared light um, distorts the color. Um, here is a similar area um, shot in a narrow infrared filter. And at the end of the day, we had like 2,000 photos of, of, of this meadow in, in infrared mode and multispectral mode. We did, we stitched all those photos in one giant panorama. We um, created an NDVI map. And in one part of this field, we noticed this. These straight lines and, and regular shapes are, are always very suspicious because um, they're almost never natural. This is the same area in black and white with a bit of an enhanced contrast. Um, so you can see it better. We studied um, what this might be. We did some research and we discovered that we're actually looking at a ground plan of a Roman Villa Rustica. Now, Villa Rustica is a beautiful term that evokes all kinds of wrong um, impressions and ideas. This is not a villa. There are no mosaics here, no columns, no hordes of coins, no busts of Caesars. Villa Rustica means simply a house in the countryside. So this is a farm, a 2000 years old farm. This white area in the middle, this rectangular, um, is the sunken floor of the main building. There were a couple of rooms and the kitchen. Um, to the left of this is a sort of triangular shape. This is um, most probably a storage area, a barn. And the square below, it's, it's barely visible, and below the main building is, um, was a stable. They could have sheep or it was maybe it was a pig sty but since this villa rustica is close to a very busy ancient roman road um, they most probably had horses that they rented to travelers we sent those pictures to to uh, true archaeologists and they were like look at this a bunch of amateurs um, did a proper aerial remote sensing and found themselves a Roman villa. They were quite amazed by these results. 
especially when we told them that it was done on a, with an old modified um, compact camera fl flown by a kite that was piloted by a 10 year old. Um, there will be no excavation. This site is pretty much irrelevant. There is nothing um, important to be found here. And of course, archaeologists don't have the money to, to um, excavate just about any site anybody finds. But the moment that we, when we created this NDVI map and something appeared on it and it turned out to be Roman Villa Rustica, that, that feeling of discovery, the eureka moment was, was something that was totally amazing. I mean, it was really, really cool to be, to be a part of it. Of it. Um, so I hope this short presentation showed you that a kite can be a fantastic aerial scientific platform, a tool of, of discovery, a tool of, of hard science, and to end where I have begun, the future of kites in this so-called time of drones is actually very, very bright. Thank you. So can I, may I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, do you, it's, uh, it's very impressive, it's really good. Um, uh, crop marks are a, a, a very good way to detect um, archaeology, but in this case, you're looking at invisible crop marks. Can I ask, do you ever follow up uh, discoveries like this with ground-based geophysics? No, no, not as not on this site, but we have um, discovered something that we thought were um, iron nature roundhouses that are actually unheard of in Slovenia, right. and we saw the the aerial photos to archaeologists and they went there and did a ground survey and discovered it was that those roundhouses were actually fairy rings mushrooms mushroom so pe people yeah. there, are, there are groups of pe people do do geophysics to follow up some of your work um yeah they, they are but but as as um, as i said this site is is on private land and it's not really okay. interested so not yet. We didn't confirm this 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 find with with the geophysics. It's very impressive and much cheaper than doing geophysics. Well done. Hey, amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Well done. Well done. All right, we've come through the end of the, our initial agenda, but I want to open it up. Does anyone else want to say any present or any give any ideas um, and just kind of an open conversation before we kind of move towards the close? And I know we've run over by an hour. But it looks like most of you've hung on to uh, hear some good words. So I'm trusting that uh, you're still interested. So does anyone else have something they prepared that they desperately want to present? Other than Jim, who can't share a screen. <laughs> All right. Um, then uh, the last thing on the agenda was just to mention the Cappy Zoom Flickr page. Uh, and I will... Let me see if I can do something to maybe try and share if this even shows. I'll give it one last shot. It probably won't show, but I'll just, can you guys see the screen? Probably not. No, we can't see the screen. Okay. So we'll stay with Jim not being able to share. I'll just point out them. Maybe stop sharing. Can you still hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay, that's good. All right, yeah, I did drop out and just rejoin. So um, can you hear me now? We hear you. Okay, uh, and we are recording still. So uh, I will not share other than just to share verbally. There is a Flickr group called Cappy Zoom. Can you try to put the pictures in your background? Because we can see your background. Yeah, that, that takes some time. I had to download it and re-swap it around. Just, okay. can't, can't swap it that quickly. Um, but in, in the uh, Flickr group, Cappy Zoom, you'll find a number of, of uh, photos that are posted by many of you. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. And I was just going to point out the, uh, I had just shared a couple shots of the Sony in-camera app that shows you the settings that you can use uh, through the application inside the camera to basically do a lot of control 
that you may not be able to do otherwise. Um, and I was going to try and show that, but I will hold off. So let's just open it up for any last questions before we uh, wrap up the session. Anybody else want to share any other kite festivals, any other gatherings before we kind of say our goodbyes? Can I just ask a, can I ask a general, can you hear me? Can I ask a general question in that yeah. um, uh, my, my impression is there's a number of kite suppliers, their stock levels are going down, down. Um, are we going to see these levels come back up I mean, into the wind that I've bought from? And um, yeah, they've, uh, they've been out of stock. Right? They've been out of stock for a number of months, a couple of years, to be honest, on, on many, on many, um, Cap Jess is rejoining, on, on many of their levitation deltas, for example. Uh, I did speak with Jim Nichols, the NZ flyer from New Zealand. Uh, yeah. He did indicate that they, into the wind, just received a big shipment um, of their, from a new factory that they've set up in China. Okay. Stocked shortly. I'm going to be at their store in Boulder, Colorado in March because my sister's daughter is getting married and I'm going to be there. So I'm going to be going to their store in Boulder, Colorado on Pearl Street and uh, taking a look at their inventory in person. Um, and then Gomburg Kites closed. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a couple other ones that have dropped off. Uh, on the positive side, um, the Wing Fang Kite Factory from China all right. Yeah, something and, great on the screen. Okay, yeah, that's the screen I was trying to share. So those are the ones that I posted. Let me just finish the thought on, on the kite supply. So the mm -hmm. Wang Fang factory in China is now starting to resupply a lot of the uh, local merchants, if you will. And they've also partnered with AliExpress, which is, I'll call it uh, like China's Amazon. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you can now get uh, directly from the factory. I would encourage you to take a look at that. I picked up uh, several kites and some pipe paraphernalia. So what you see on the screen here, if you scroll up, uh, that's the time lapse. That's just looking at the back of the Sony camera. Uh, well, first of all, it shows the little balance with a GoPro 10 that weighs out at a chubby 162 grams, uh, but it does all that 4K video stabilized. Uh, and then the other screen shots you see here are just from the Sony um, uh, time-lapse application that allows you a lot of control uh, and really the one where it says custom there where you, you pick the interval, pick how many shots, you can pick the exposure reaction. This one, I didn't pick up on this when I first did this, but that AE line and it has, you can either lock the exposure when you take your first picture, it just says that's the exposure the next 900 pictures are going to get. Uh, and then there's tracking, which has low, medium, or high. Uh, and that's how fast does it react to um, a change in exposure and amount of light. So I normally run it on high so that it automatically basically does an auto exposure depending on that, you know, that particular image. Um, and, and so anyway, that's, that's what's there. And then crocodile grips we talked about earlier. And then if you scroll down, you'll just see uh, some examples. There are some examples there of the still images from the GoPro if you want to see those. Uh, and then just other people have posted uh, some pictures. If you scroll down through here, you'll see a number of um, photos from other cappers uh, that have contributed to uh, to the CAPI uh, groups. So I'm just if you want to go in and dive in and see some of the actual detailed photos, there's some great shots here from Pierre and, and others that I encourage you to take a look at that we haven't had time to. Uh, uh, dig into here. So um, thank you for sharing that. I was unable to do it. Um, any other comments, questions before we wrap up our call? Yeah, for me, so uh, I, I, it's, it's really good to see the enthusiasm that the various people have got, especially um, uh, the young man from uh, the Isle of Man. He's, I think he's one of the yeah. newest shoppers. <laughs> and, and the innovations from um, <clears throat> and, uh, um, and the people who are um, always experimenting. Uh, that's really good. One of, one, of, one of the problems we have here, Sue, is the wind. Um, what, I, what I'd like is a kite that can fly from five miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. 
I me too. Me too. Today, could, uh, today it's been blowing 80 miles an hour. Right. But with 80 yeah. miles an hour, you can fly a brick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that one. What's Leffler's door? Uh, I'll, I'll order a brick from Into the Wind then. Thank you. <laughs> you just have to bridle it correctly. <laughs> That's the only secret. The secret yeah. of bridling. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I want to tell everyone um, we can keep going here, but I want to yeah, state yeah. that the last couple of years have been tough. Um, with, you know, with COVID, and we haven't been able to meet and, and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I appreciate just these gatherings that we can do virtually just to kind of keep the DNA going. Uh, uh, so thank you all for taking a, a big chunk of your time uh, today. Uh, Jim, Jim, I had, I had one question for, uh, for Jasha. Did you mention that uh, you have a festival going on in May? Yes. When, when in May? Um, from 26th to 28th. Um, okay. We are still in the, <clears throat> in the preliminary phase. Um, we have sent some in. Okay, good. And Sandro, you had a question? Yes, uh, I was just uh, wondering if I can point out about uh, uh, Wi-Fi connections. Uh, uh, I have a direct experience of using uh, a DJI camera. DJI camera is uh, extremely light. It is itself uh, 200 grams and so, but uh, uh, with the Wi-Fi module uh, uh, added, uh, it is possible to control fully, uh, but fully the camera. Yeah, uh, okay, but uh, yes, that's a DJI. Uh, it is possible to fully control the camera uh, with uh, a, 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 a phone, and uh, uh, the Wi-Fi range is 100 meter without having a repeater, without having other things. So I'm flying at 100 meter, uh, controlling pen, controlling uh, tilt, uh, changing from pictures to video and so yeah. okay this is my new cap camera i'm just going to okay. bolt it onto my cap rig <laughs> and it's got control out to six kilometers yes but uh, that's another story okay <laughs> attached to the kite line okay <laughs> but go ahead sandra i'm sorry no, 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 it's, uh, it's finished. It is just the information that uh, Wi-Fi control 100 meter uh, distance uh, is, uh, is a positive experience uh, uh, directly with the D DJI system. Uh, so is, that, is, that, is that the Osmo? DJI? The Osmo. Yes, okay. the Osmo DJI. Yeah, I never, I, I could never reach more than 75, 80 meters maximum. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, I, I have spoken widely with uh, Michel for sure about uh, this matter, and in fact, uh, he had uh, uh, told me the necessity of a repeater and so. Frankly speaking. I never was able to set the repeater so that it was working, but uh, the system itself flies at 100 meter and I can do all the controls with uh, a Xiaomi normal uh, cell phone. It's not uh, a super. Mm, okay. That's all. All right, good. Any other last comments, questions from the group? Uh, Jim, I, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for putting this together. I appreciate it. And just, just a little applause to the, uh, to the rest of the presenters. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, great job, everyone. Keep the, keep the kites flying and the pictures coming. Yes. All right, I think with that, if there's no other last questions, uh, we'll say our goodbyes.
Uh, thank you all for joining in on this fun CAPI Zoom uh, 2022. And as noted, um, even though I disconnected three or four times, I think it's still recording. Uh, and I will uh, pull that together within the next few days and post it up uh, on uh, YouTube with a link on the CAP form so everyone can see it. There were a number of people, especially in Asia, that this was not the best time for them. And, uh, and, and by the way, the next CAPI is in Fano in Denmark. Yeah, in and, and June. I'm, I'm hoping to be there. So okay, what is the next uh, Zoom meeting? I'm going to try and get there. So. What in is person. the next Zoom meeting? That's an in-person, face-to-face CAPI meeting. In <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll say goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye, Dora.